Hello, sons and daughters. Tonight, old Tex will dive deep into them bone-chilling tales that'll make your skin crawl. So welcome to weekly compilation of horror stories, where fear runs thicker than moonshine on a moonless night. Let's go. In the heart of Yosemite National Park, a group of European tourists reveled in the awe-inspiring beauty of their surroundings. The towering granite cliffs, lush meadows, and cascading waterfalls painted a picturesque backdrop for their adventure. Excitement filled the air as they hiked along the well-trodden trails, capturing memories and immersing themselves in the grandeur of nature. But little did they know that an ancient darkness lurked within the depths of these majestic landscapes. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the wilderness, an ominous figure emerged from the darkness. The creature reminiscent of the Wendigo possessed an otherworldly aura instilling fear in the hearts of the unsuspecting tourist. Larry, a seasoned park ranger who dedicated his life to protecting Yosemite's natural treasures, stumbled upon a distressed group of tourists. It was late at night when a distressed group found Larry's cabin, their faces etched with terror. They recounted stories of shadowy figures stalking their campsite, their presence as chilling as the frigid mountain air. Initially skeptical, Larry attributed their fears to an overactive imagination fueled by the eerie ambience of the wilderness. But as their pleas grew more desperate, a flicker of unease ignited within the ranger's soul. Determined to ensure their safety, he decided to investigate their claims firsthand. Venturing into the darkness, armed only with a flashlight and a sense of duty, Larry's skepticism rapidly dissolved. Shadow danced in the periphery of his vision, whispering ancient secrets that sent shivers down his spine. And then, amidst the stillness of the night, the horrifying creature materialized before him, his presence defying all logic. Fear gripped Larry's heart as the tourists scattered in a desperate attempt to escape the clutches of the malevolent beings. The ranger, driven by his duty to protect, summoned every ounce of courage within him. But his efforts proved futile against the supernatural strength and agility of the creatures. As the shadowy figure lunged at him, overpowering his defenses, darkness engulfed Larry's consciousness. Hours passed, and the distant sound of approaching sirens heralded the arrival of the park police. Disoriented and battered, Larry awoke to their concerned faces, their questions probing for answers. Struggling to recount the harrowing ordeal, Larry explained the unearthly encounter he had witnessed. However, disbelief clouded the officers' expressions, their skepticism palpable. They dismissed his account as the delusions of an exhausted ranger, attributing the tourist's distress to a combination of fear and exhaustion. Left to grapple with the remnants of his shattered reality, Larry stood alone. It was a nightless night in the Finnish wilderness. Just me and my dog couldn't sleep, so I decided to just hike until I'd be tired. It was all fine until my dog makes a dead stop and I can't convince her to take another step. She put her head down, her entire mane is up, and she is growling this low, things are going to go down growl. This is a pretty easy going dog. I have never heard her make that sound before or after. Her most common reaction to wildlife is to scream bark out of exitment. She is very used to forest and its critters. But this was very different. She was seeing danger. And I saw absolutely nothing. I heard nothing. I freaked out. So I backtracked to a little parking lot we had passed some time ago and called a local cab driver if he could get us. I had just had it, whatever it was. I was too tired for it. The cab driver came and took me to my car. Paid like 60 euros, but it was kind of worth it. I am from Delaware, and I experienced the same thing when I was 15. Me and my friend was walking through the woods, and I noticed something moving ahead. I told my friend to stop and look with me at 
what it was. It was an all-white humanoid creature moving in a weird way by trees, and it noticed us before we did it. It was when it looked at us that scared us off running. It was all white with no facial features, no eyes, no mouth, no nothing. Just all white blank face and taller body with weird arms. We both took off running. I want to know what this was. Years ago, while hiking with my girlfriend in a very isolated area, we discovered we were being stalked. It was late in the day, not dark yet, but getting there. We were on a path with heavy woods on each side. We could hear movement in the woods, sounds of leaves rustling, branches snapping, etc. That seemed to parallel our path and matched our movements. However, we couldn't see anything. We tested it, stopped walking to listen, and the noise would stop. Start and stop again, and it would match our movements. Finally, I left my girlfriend on the path and walked toward the noise. I did see something that to this day, I can't explain, and it scared me very badly. When I saw it, it had been behind a tree and quickly ran away. It was probably 30 feet from me when it took off. Humanoid shape, extremely tall and thin. I have always described it as being almost skeletal. It was pale white. I'd estimate it was 7 feet tall or more. It ran away very quickly, which is a good thing, because I was paralyzed with fear after seeing it. After a minute, I got my wits back a little and went back to my girlfriend, and we got out of there. Luckily, we didn't have far to go. True story, and it made me realize that there are unexplainable things in this world. I wasn't alone on this one, but it's a close enough story that I thought might be appreciated here. I was 17 and out with my boyfriend hiking out to some caves he said he knew about, but we had gotten turned around and lost the daylight before we made it there. So no big deal, we decided to bivouac in a small clearing, built a campfire and made the most of a rare opportunity for some secluded sexy times. We were getting close when he starts and just bolts upright, listening for something. I listened to and off in the distance. You could hear this commotion going on, rustling and cracking from branches, and it is steadily getting closer to our camp. We figured maybe an animal chasing a rabbit or something. But the sounds just keep getting closer, and suddenly my boyfriend just leaps to his feet, saying that's someone running. It was like he just hit a panic button in my brain. He grabbed my hand, and we both just bolted, leaving our packs and everything. We ran until I thought my lungs were on fire, but when we stopped, we could still hear the sound getting louder. Suddenly my lungs didn't matter, and we ran for what felt like hours. It felt like whoever it was would catch us if we slowed down for even a moment. I've never hauled as so fast for so long. Finally, we ended up on a gravel road dotted with an occasional house. We figured out where we were and how to get back to where his car was parked. My boyfriend went back with a couple buddies the next day to see if he could find our campsite and said some of the stuff from his pack was piled up next to the fire, but his extra boots and water was missing. My pack was nowhere to be seen. During a mentally unstable period of my life, I stayed out in a cabin on a friend's property in Texas I was out there for about a week, meant to stay for two weeks. But you'll see why I left, with no electricity, no running water, no nothing. It was late autumn, so I didn't have to worry about air conditioning. To get refrigerated food, I'd have to drive about two miles to his house, then another mile to the store. There were no wires, no random pieces of equipment, no nothing. From the second night onward, I would hear beeping outside behind the cabin. It was a single steady beep most of the time, and sometimes two or three paired together. Since I was a bit mental, as stated, I thought it was just my mind the first night. Problem is, it continued the next night and so forth, but not in the same spot. On the fourth night, it was out front of the cabin. The fifth, it was out back again, and the last night, it was right beside the bedroom wall, left side of the cabin. 
I searched high and low the first two days I heard it and even asked my friend about it, but he assured me there was nothing out there and he didn't go out there. Even if he did, I would be able to hear him. We tried to get his dog to stay with me the third night, but as soon as the beeping started, it hid under the bed, started whining, and eventually started crying, so I drove him back to my friend's house. With how close that beeping got the last night, I, I didn't bother staying. I'm pretty sure I had an encounter with a skinwalker, too, but that was during a road trip. I've spent more than my share of time alone in the woods, but one occasion definitely stands out as the creepiest thing I've experienced while no one else was around. I have a friend that has 40 acres outside of town that he has slowly converted into a subsistence farm for his family. Years ago, when he mostly only had a dozen or so chickens out there, I spent a few months living on the property in a tent while I was between seasonal work. At the time, the property was decades, neglected, overgrown pasture land with a few clumps of denser woods. I had set up my tent and homestead right in the middle of the property in a small, clear area between two densely wooded thickets. My friend would come by once a day to feed the animals, but other than that, there was zero chance of me seeing another human unless I left the property. I really enjoyed the solitude and had taken to observing nature in a way that I had never really done before. When the incident occurred, I had been living out there for about two months, so I was well used to the sounds of nature outside my tent at night. I had gotten to the point where I wouldn't even bother to get out of the tent and look if I heard a small animal walking past my tent at night. I'd even gotten used to the sound that the roof of the pump house made when wind blew hard from the southeast. My friend had been short on nails when he was building the roof over the pump so the southeast corner wasn't nailed down and a strong wind would cause the corner of the corrugated metal roof to peel up and then crash down loudly when the wind stopped. It was about 200 feet away from my tent so it had caused me to jump a bit when I first moved out there. But within a month, it had just become another sound outside my tent at night. It was even sort of comforting, like some people that live in big cities say that they can't sleep without the sound of traffic outside their window. It probably helped that the sound was always paired with the sound of wind blowing through the trees. So one night I'm tucked in my sleeping bag, starting to drift off when I hear the shed corner come crashing down. Nothing to worry about. I probably didn't even open my eyes. But then I hear what sounds like a person mimicking the sound the shed had made. Right outside my tent. My blood freezes in my veins and my eyes open wide in the darkness. And I hold perfectly still. I know that my friend has already come and gone hours before. I am alone on a piece of land that is large enough that there is no reason for a person to accidentally end up next to my tent in the middle of the night. After a few moments, the wind makes the shed roof crash again, and again I heard a person mimic the crashing sound a few seconds later. I called out and asked if there was anyone there. No response. The shed roof crashed a third time, but this time there was no mimicking sound. So I am out of my sleeping bag and out of my tent flashlight in one hand, camp knife in the other. I turned my flashlight right where the fake crashing sound seemed to come from. Nothing. It's the edge of the woods, but the sound had been close, and I can see through the brush well enough to tell that there isn't a person hiding behind the bushes and low branches. I'm looking at the ground, and none of the dead leaves look particularly disturbed. I'm trying to figure out how far someone could have moved at a slow enough pace to not make enough sound for me to hear their footsteps on the leaf litter. Answer, not very far, when the shed roof crashes again. And I hear the same fake crash sound again, right next to me, where I am 100% positive there isn't a person standing. At this point, my heart is beating a mile a minute, and I'm getting ready to believe in the supernatural. While sweeping my flashlight beam through the human free spot the sound seemed to be coming from, I see a bird. It's sitting in the low branches of a tree at about head height. I stop moving the flashlight and keep the beam on the bird for a moment. 
The bird opens its mouth and makes the fake crashing sound. Oh, and the little guy stuck around for another month making the same sound, so I eventually got used to his sound. At night as well, but I resented it every time I heard it. Every year, we take a three-day family canoe trip in central Pennsylvania. I was around 16 and brought some friends along for our journey. This is a pretty remote area with very limited cell phone reception and not many permanent residents. We take all of our gear with us in four canoes and just find a clearing for us to camp. The water level was low that year, so it was slow going. The first day we relaxed and didn't paddle much, found a clearing and made camp. On the second day, we had to make up some time, so we paddled until dusk. It was getting late and we were in a part of the river with mountains on both sides. There was a small path leading up between some pine trees and a small patch of sand that we could beach our canoes. We start unloading our supplies. I set out to see how much room there is for our campsite. Not ten feet into the pine trees, I see three tents torn to shreds, coolers strung out everywhere, clothing pieces half buried in the dirt. There isn't any way in or out from that campsite except the river. It was too late for us to look for a new spot, so we ended up staying there. That night every sound I heard was going to murder me. I could hear rustling leaves coming closer to the campsite, then a loud crack from a log breaking. Our dog started growling and took off running after something. We could hear whatever he was chasing making its way up the mountain. Our dog returned a few minutes later, thankfully. Woke up early after barely sleeping and got the hell out of there. When I was backing packing in the Sierras two summers ago, I had set up camp at this beautiful spot I came across and spent the night there. Well, since the campsite offered such a nice view, I decided to stay there an extra night. About an hour after sunset, I got into my tent and started to fall asleep. In the middle of the night, I heard distinct footsteps nearby, and I immediately thought it was a bear or, or mountain lion. Humans were mostly out of the option because I was three weeks into my trip and had only seen a couple of climbers 25 miles down the trail. The footsteps stopped, but the hairs on the back of my neck were raised like never before. I could feel something outside my tent. I had my ice axe gripped in my hand and stayed still waiting for more noise all night. I woke up the next morning still gripping my axe and unzipped my tent. And in the middle of the fire ring I made was an empty handle of Josie Hervo sitting in a pile of ashes. There were no footprints around and never heard or saw anyone for the next three days. Growing up, the woods behind my house were my sanctuary. I spent countless hours exploring the area, learning every nook and cranny of the dense forest. The centerpiece of this woodland retreat was a creek where I would often spend my days enjoying the cool, refreshing water. One late summer day, as I walked through the woods with my loyal white lab by my side, I came across a group of kids I didn't recognize. I assumed they were from the local military academy, taking advantage of their free time to enjoy the outdoors. The kids were daring each other to jump into the creek from a 15 to 20 foot high cliff. I couldn't help but feel concerned as I knew that the water level had dropped significantly by that time of year, exposing several large rocks just beneath the surface. As I approached the group, I politely pointed out the hidden danger suggesting they refrain from jumping to avoid any serious injuries. One of the kids, clearly feeling challenged by my advice, took great offense. He unleashed a torrent of curses at me and, with a defiant smirk, took a running start and jumped into the creek. Miraculously, he avoided the rocks, but the danger didn't seem to faze him. Fueled by adrenaline, the boy stormed out of the water and charged towards me. I calmly retreated up the bank, grabbed my trusty walking stick, a six and a half foot long inch thick octagonal oak oar, and stood my ground with my protective lab by my side. The boy's friends who had initially cheered him on 
now realized the gravity of the situation and began urging him to back off. He hesitated for a moment, looking up at me and my imposing weapon, and then at my snarling dog. The realization that he had bitten off more than he could chew was written all over his face. In that instant, the bravado that had propelled him off the cliff and towards me vanished. He scrambled back up the cliff at a speed that rivaled his descent, his friends close behind him. As the group disappeared into the woods, I couldn't help but feel a strange sense of satisfaction. I hadn't sought out a confrontation, but I had stood my ground and protected both myself and my dog. In the end, I hoped that the encounter had taught the reckless young man a valuable lesson in respecting both nature and the advice of others who know it well. After the excitement had subsided, I continued my walk with my loyal companion, grateful for the peaceful solitude that the woods usually provided. The creek, now quiet and undisturbed, seemed to share my relief, its waters once again flowing gently and undisturbed through the heart of the forest. Lake Story in Galesburg is a popular spot for our nighttime walks, and aside from the occasional pesky raccoon, we've never experienced any issues. However, on the night of July 2, 2020, as we reached a particularly dark section of the trail deep in the woods, we heard a loud noise like something large was about to fall on us. I quickly pulled my friend out of the way, and as I looked back, I saw an object almost hit the ground but then seemingly disappear. I dismissed it as shadows playing tricks on me and my friend, who doesn't believe in anything paranormal, UFO, or spiritual found it strange as well. A few days later, we walked the same path and experienced a similar occurrence. We heard a violent rustling in the trees, but once again, we brushed it off despite feeling unnerved. On our next walk, we arrived at the exact spot on the trail, and this time, we saw a four-foot-tall figure standing about thirty feet away. Initially, I thought it might be a deer, but my friend saw it too. I quickly grabbed her flashlight to shine a light on the figure, but there was no deer in sight. Instead, the mysterious figure dashed through the woods at an incredible speed. I don't know who to contact about these encounters, as the police might consider me crazy, and I don't want to put my family at risk, unless there's a drug-addled, naked, small person in the woods throwing things and stalking us. I'm at a loss for an explanation. These unnerving encounters have happened three times in the same location, deep within the woods at Lake Story, near the far end of the trail. I realize that whoever reads this might think I'm a nut, but I assure you this is our experience. This story was told to me by my uncle and swears it really happened. He was the only one in the family this happened to, so no one else could back his story. I don't know if I believe this myself. In 1979, there was a 12-year-long civil war in El Salvador. My uncle was in the military. He was sent to the woods or jungle with like six other guys to go look for milita groups that we supposedly camping out there. After walking in the woods or jungle for hours, they suddenly felt the ground shake as if something big was coming towards them. He described it like in Jurassic Park. Then the T-Rex was coming towards them, and the water rippled. He said they thought it was the enemy doing something, so they hid. He said that he was shocked when he saw a giant. He said it was walking in the distance. I asked him if it was just maybe a really, really big person like Bigfoot, and he said no. It was more of a jack and the beanstalk kind of giant. He said there were trees blocking the view somewhat, but that he could make out that it was like a really big human. He said it was as tall at the tallest tree there. He said he tried to get a good look at it but he was terrified and didn't want to get out of his hiding when he realized what it was. He said the giant basically just walked past them. He said they were all terrified and, and waited there for a while as they were scared to bump into another one. He said two of the guys suggested trying to kill it to get rich, but the guy in charge told them to stand down. 
My uncle said it. Everyone thought they were idiots for suggesting such a thing. He said they walked back to base as quickly and quietly as possible. They told everyone when they got back. No one believed them. They were friends with the pilots. And the pilots called bullshit on their story because they fly over the jungle all the time and would have seen such a creature, especially if it was as tall as the trees as they claim. He said all of the guys described what they saw. One guy claimed that it appeared bald. Another guy said he thinks it had some sort of loincloth like Tarzan. My uncle emphasized that he didn't get a good look and that all he knows is that the ground was shaking as if some really big creature was coming towards them. He saw what appeared as a giant human walking in the distance. He got down and hid and waited till it was gone. I began to ask him things like if it was real, don't you think they would have found a body or some bones of something that big, especially since El Salvador is so tiny in relation to other parts of the world. He responded along the lines of, I, I don't know about none of that stuff. I just know what I saw that day. I don't know how I, I feel about this one personally. This one seems a little out there. My mom said maybe it was some sort of spirit that just made itself appear as a giant to scare them. During the Civil War times, my mom claims there was a lot more paranormal things going on because of all the deaths that were happening. A lot of innocent people were being killed. My grandma would say if you looked out the window of the house, you would see dead bodies on the street. That wouldn't explain the ground shaking, though. Has anyone ever encountered a story of a jack? In a beanstalk kind of giant, this one scared me as a kid because it's so unbelievable that if he did actually see that, that's crazy. I'll never forget the night of September 9, 2015. It was around 11.40 p.m., and I was driving up Route 43 towards the Peaks of Otter. I was just passing Turkey Mountain Road when something strange caught my eye. My headlights hit a figure that seemed out of place. It wasn't until I got closer that I realized what it was. I knew what I saw was going to sound crazy, but I had to call Bedford County Dispatch. I told them that I saw a Bigfoot with a baby. The dispatcher was understandably confused and asked me to repeat myself. I insisted that I wasn't drinking and that I saw what I saw. Two days had passed since the sighting, and I felt like I had to share what I witnessed. When I went back in daylight, I saw footprints that were larger than anything I could make. The creature's stride was longer than anything I had ever seen. The footprints were bigger than my two feet put together, end to end, and I wear a size 8 shoe. The creature was holding its baby just like a human would, and the baby was looking right at me. I later described the baby as looking just like Chewbacca from Star Wars. The dispatcher asked me if they had received any other calls like mine before, but he had never heard anything like it. A deputy checked out the area and didn't find anything. I know they were not bears. I can't explain what I saw, but I know what I saw. The memory of that night will stay with me forever. I have heard many rumors of a monstrous creature born in the mountains about 15 miles away from our city. The people living there are said to be deeply superstitious and almost untouched by civilization. The creature, which was born about two weeks ago, has caused a great deal of terror and dread among the mountaineers. They believe that the devil has appeared among them in the form of the monster that was born in their midst. Recently, rumors of the creature have reached our city, and those who have dared to visit it describe it as being somewhat larger than an average newborn covered in short black hair and dark in color, despite having a white father and mother. From either side of its head grow short horns, and it has a long tail that resembles a cloven hoof. To the mountaineers who have seen it, it is the very picture of the devil. There are many stories about the incident surrounding the creature's birth, but one stands out. It is said that the father of the creature had some religious beliefs which he tried to impose on his wife, who did not agree with him. 
She declared that she would rather see the devil than have a cross always before her eyes. Shortly after this, she gave birth to the monstrous creature. In terror, the father summoned several neighbors, and one of them, more brave than the rest, offered to kill the creature by bleeding it to death. As he took out his knife, the creature raised itself, got down from the bed, and walked across the room, addressing the wood, be executioner in terrible language, and threatening him with dire consequences if he attempted to harm it. It then declared that it would live for seven days, and having revealed its purpose for coming into the world, it would then die. As strange as it may sound, this story has many believers, and few dare to go near the little cabin in the mountain where the poor mother of the miserable creature lives. The creature lived for seven days and died on the last Monday, the eighth day, without ever speaking again. Its birth and death have filled the mountaineers with such uneasiness that they shun the cabin and its inhabitants. I sat on a wooden bar stool behind the register in the nastiest gas station I've seen before or since. It was my third night in a row on the graveyard shift, despite my constant pleas for daylight hours. At night, the place became purgatory. No matter how hard you'd scrub or how many times you'd mop, a thick film of filth remained on every surface. I would go hours without seeing a single car drive past. I often questioned if the rapture happened, and I was the only one left. We were a stone's throw from another 24-hour gas station franchise that was cleaner, properly lit, and had an equipment update within the last decade. Needless to say, I had, I had a lot of downtime. It was half past midnight. I had six and a half hours to kill. I was reading from the first volume of Johnny the Homicidal Maniac and doing my best not to look at the clock. As I would soon learn, I was being irresponsibly unaware of what was going on around me. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a brown wood panel station wagon pull up to a pump. Two men exited the car and walked inside. One looked older. He was wearing a leather jacket, the same shade of brown as his vehicle. The younger guy was close to my age. He wore a faded Carhartt coat and work boots. Both were covered in a layer of dirt or dust that suggested recent manual labor. These were country gentlemen. I greeted them and asked what I could help them with. They told me they're not interested in buying anything, but they had to stop by and make sure everything was okay here. I was appreciative, albeit visibly confused. The younger man asked me, did you know you're being watched? As he subtly gestured outside. Sure enough, I saw the dark outline of a man standing completely motionless near a streetlight. None of his features were visible, but I could tell he was staring directly at us. The older man said they had been driving by 45 minutes earlier and almost hit him as he was standing in the middle of the road. He theorized the man was possibly on drugs. They decided to take the long way home that night to see if the guy was still hanging around. Mind you, this was 45 minutes after they almost ran the guy over. Had he been watching me that entire time, I looked outside again to find he hadn't moved a muscle. He was positioned on the border of the streetlight's illumination. I noticed his jaw was moving like he was saying something. I asked the younger man to lock the deadbolt on the front door literally my only line of defense in this situation. They both agreed to wait with me in the store while I contacted police. Until that moment, I maintained composure, trying not to make it obvious that I felt extremely vulnerable. Here I was at the mercy of three complete strangers, hoping the two I had in front of me were genuinely there to help. When the dispatch operator confirmed they had units on the way, I felt safe enough to end the call. I thanked the two men profusely, and they walked out the door. After pausing for a moment, they turned around and came back inside. The younger one plainly stated, Lock the door, he's coming this way, then immediately ducks back out the door so I can lock myself in. As I flipped the deadbolt into position, I could see the dark figure moving toward the building at an intention pace, making it across the parking lot in about ten strides. He tried opening the door, but found it wouldn't bud. 
He asked the older man, Where did the girl go? Who then tried to buy me some time by saying I was in the bathroom and I would be back in a minute. So this man, this possible assailant, walks around the corner towards the bathroom door and disappears behind the building. And of course we didn't have cameras outside to keep employees safe on the job. The only three working security feeds happened to all be trained exclusively on where the cashier would stand. It felt accusatory. It was at this point when real fear began to set in and I lost control of my composure. This unidentified man, who had apparently been watching me for close to an hour, was now laying in wait for me to exit the bathroom. I started to hyperventilate his thoughts of what his motivation could be. Had he been watching me before tonight? Was my store chosen at random, or did this guy come here? Because he saw a small female at the register. Was he actually on drugs, or was he just mentally unstable enough for it to appear that way? Did he have a weapon on him, or did he plan to use his bare hands for whatever he was going to do? I peeked out the window and saw the two gentlemen exchanging glances and muted discussion of how to proceed from there. Thankfully, a local police sub tore down the street and into the parking lot of the building next door, turning on his flashers and quickly coming to a stop. As soon as I was absolutely sure the man was gone, I sat on the curb outside, sucking every last drop of nicotine out of my cigarette. I held in a trembling hand, as if I telepathically summoned her. My phone rings with a call from my best friend. She said she was thinking about me and thought she would call to say what's up since she knew I would be bored. All I could respond with was, get here, now. Twenty minutes later, all my roommates showed up in a pickup truck and stayed with me long enough to feel comfortable again. As anticlimactic as this ended, it could have definitely been a lot worse. I could have been robbed or murdered, or all three, all because I wasn't paying attention. I'll never know the true will of that dark figure under the streetlight, and maybe that's for the best. I don't think I could easily get past knowing what could have lied in store for me, and I wish I could have gotten one of the gentleman's contact information so I could send a beef jerky bouquet or something manly that says thank you. In July 1968, my family and I were living in a small town west end of Montrose County called Buravan, Colorado. In the early morning, I was awakened by the barking of a family dog named Tippy outside my bedroom window. Tippy never really barked unless someone or something was in a yard that wasn't supposed to be. I remember waking up out of dead sleep and hearing Tippy constantly barking and wondering why my older brother, who's sleeping bunk above and my parents sleeping in the bedroom joining ours, weren't telling Tippy to quit. Finally, I had enough of it and decided to turn over in my bed and look out the window myself. When I did, I couldn't believe what saw. There it was a small circle ship with its landed gear down and hatch with stairs fold down to the ground. Next to the ship were green lizard-like beings. Their eyes were bright yellow and some tanks were on their backs in another bag. They didn't have fingers but had web hands that looked like a bow and arrow. Their body was thin and scaly. Their legs were also thin, and their feet had V-shaped toes. I remember thinking to myself this was some kind of hunting party because my dad was a bow hunter himself, and that kind of gave me the idea. I could tell they were searching for something. Then another alien came off the ship. It was much bigger than the others and seemed to give the others orders. Tippy again began her barking, and the alien close to our house seemed to be upset with her barking. I could see it looking over at Tippy, and it started walking over to her. I then jumped off my bed and headed into my parents' room to wake my mother up. I remember how hard it was to wake her. She acted like she was on a heavy drug or something. I couldn't get her to wake up. Finally was able to get her up and told them something was going on outside and that it was going hurt Tippy. She was still not awake and was sluggish. My mother followed me to my bedroom. Once there, I showed what I was seeing outside. I don't know what they did to my mom, but she couldn't see them. All she wanted to do was sleep. 
Finally, my mother got up from my bed and told me to crawl to the other side of my bed away from the window. I did what I was told. The last thing I remember before going to sleep was looking over in the closet where the window cast light on my clothes and saw two of the lizard beings trying to look in the window. No other sound came from Tippy. My mother wasn't drinking or taking anything that would cause sedation. I firmly believe they did something to the family to make them sleep. It just didn't work on me. In the morning, the first thing I did was to run out and check on Tippy and my PGs. Sure enough, she was lying in the front yard waiting for kids to come to play with her. She acted like nothing had happened the night before. I was 12 years old at the time, and the memory is etched in my conscience. It was not a dream or hallucination. I've included an image of what the lizard people looked like. Interestingly enough, on the same night my mother passed away in 2016, she asked me if I had remembered seeing the lizard people in their ship in our yard in Colorado. That was the only time she acknowledged witnessing the incident. The Tongass National Forest, located in the rugged wilderness of Alaska, is a place of raw beauty and untamed wilderness. Towering ancient trees reach towards the heavens. Their branches intertwined like a protective canopy against the sky. The forest is teeming with life, from the graceful flight of bald eagles to the elusive footprints left behind by bears and wolves. But beneath its serene facade, there lies a dark undercurrent. A whispered legend of strange creatures lurking deep within the woods. It is in this enigmatic setting that I find myself, Anna, a diligent park ranger with a passion for protecting the natural wonders of the world. Transferred to Tongass National Forest after a heated disagreement with my former boss, I couldn't help but feel a sense of trepidation as I set foot in this new territory. Rumors of bizarre sightings and unexplained phenomena echoed through the park ranger community, but I dismissed them as mere tales meant to thrill campfire gathering. As I delved into my duties conducting routine patrols and ensuring the safety of visitors, I gradually became aware of a subtle shift in the forest's atmosphere. Whispering voices carried on the wind, their words elusive and indiscernible. Shadows danced at the periphery of my vision, vanishing as I turned to face them. Strange occurrences became part of my daily routine. A rustle in the undergrowth where no creature should be, an inexplicable chill running down my spine in the dead of summer. With each passing night, the forest revealed more of its chilling secret. It started one evening as I sat alone in my ranger cabin, poring over maps and reports. A growl, guttural and unnatural, reverberated through the walls. Startled, I rose from my chair and rushed outside, my heart pounding in my chest. The night air was thick with anticipation as I scanned the area, but I found no trace of its origin. Just as I turned to retreat, my gaze fell upon a pair of glowing eyes in the distance, a haunting, unearthly luminescence that pierced the darkness. Driven by an insatiable curiosity, tinged with a tinge of fear, I cautiously ventured towards those mesmerizing orbs. The forest seemed to hold its breath as I closed the gap, my footsteps echoing in the eerie silence. And then there it was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen, standing on two legs like a man, yet possessing the snarling visage of a wild beast. It resembled the infamous dogman of folklore. Its hulking figure, covered in matted fur, seemed to blend seamlessly with the shadows. With trembling hands, I steadied my rifle and took aim. The sound of the gunshot reverberated through the forest, accompanied by a growl that sent shivers down my spine. The wounded creature retreated, disappearing into the depths of the woods, but not before casting me a piercing glare that chilled me to the core. As my heart raced with adrenaline, I approached the cave from where the creature had emerged, and there, in the pale glow of my flashlight, I made a horrifying discovery. The cave floor was littered with the remains of hikers, bones torn clothing, and gear strewn haphazardly. 
The realization hit me like a physical blow. This creature, this dogman, had been hunting unsuspecting victims within these very woods, feasting upon their lives in a macabre dance of death. Distressed and filled with anxiety, I fumbled for my radio and called for backup. The police arrived, their presence bringing a semblance of comfort amidst the nightmare that had unfolded. I recounted the events, my voice trembling with the weight of what I had witnessed. The remains of nearly twenty hikers painted a grim picture of the forest-hidden horrors. As a native Michigander, I remember back in the 90s my stepbrother, James, my cousin Lalo, and three other friends of mine and I were up at Houghton Lake during the summer for some fishing, swimming, drinking, and smoking weed. Things that guys do in their twenties. It was fun and great memories, and none of us have ever heard, let alone know about Dogman. Anyways, it was an uneventful day besides the typical fun we all had. Now, as the day was ending and the sun was going down, not quite sunset, but close, we all packed into James Ford's tin pickup after we finished cleaning up and packing our bock and fishing equipment. Lilo had another joint left at the time, real good red hair, since he. James was like, there's a dirt road that goes around the lake. Do you guys want to drive down it and see where it goes? We all said yes, and we drove out to explore this newly found road. So as we're driving down this dirt road, the foliage was like prehistoric times. With huge ferns as shrubbery. The sun was beginning to set, and the tree canopy was making its surrounding area darker than it is. So James pulls over on the side of the road, turns off the engine, gets out, and starts walking into the woods. Someone asked what he was doing, and James replied, I'm going to explore the area. So we all get out and follow behind him. There's no trail, so James, who's leading, is making a trail. Well, there's an incline, and we're all walking up, and it's getting darker every second. Suddenly, James stops, and my cousin, who's behind James, asks why he stopped. James, from what I was told later, said, Do you hear that? Looking intently into the growing darkness of the woods. Lalo says, Yeah. What is it? I don't know, answered James. Now, we all stopped wondering what was going on. Now we didn't go too far into the thick woods, maybe fifty yards up the slope. Suddenly I hear, oh, shit, and see James running past me, and I hear my cousin saying the same thing seconds later and running back down to the truck. I'm last in the liberty, confused since information is barely reaching me, but my cousin and stepbrother are running for their lives. Remember it now, getting pitch dark, and as everyone else except me has turned around, making their way back to James's pickup, I start hearing branches or sticks breaking. By now, I'm the only one who hadn't turned around yet, and it's only been seconds. So I hear sticks, maybe branches, breaking, and something is making its way towards me, and it's picking up speed. I then around now, filled with fear, and run as fast as I can down the slope. I tripped on an exposed tree root and sprained my ankle, but I don't stop and continued my way to the pickup. This thing was close behind me. Now I'm about five, maybe ten feet away from James's pickup, and all the guys were in it yelling at me to hurry up. I dive onto the bed of James's truck. James steps on the gas and peels out as fast as that V6 can take that tiny S10. All I can hear is, did you see that? What the hell was it? James is saying, yeah, and I don't know. I and Brian were asked, what did they see? James couldn't answer because he wasn't sure and neither could my cousin. They both just said they can't believe it. Now, I never saw anything, nor did my two other friends who were behind my cousin. Just James and Lalo saw it, and they never elaborated on what they saw. Maybe they couldn't believe their eyes. I was maybe 25 years old at the time, and today I'm 52. I only knew of Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and Yefos. It was only five years ago did I first hear about the Dogman. I know there is another Dogman encounter surrounding the Houghton Lake area. Did they see a Dogman? I don't know, but this is my experience and belief that they did. 
I don't talk to my stepbrother or my cousin Lilo in heaven in 15 years. Still, I can't help but think about what exactly did they both see. When I was in middle school, I coon hunted a lot, mostly with my dad, but I knew the hills and the hollers enough around our home in West Virginia that he would let me take friends. I could go anywhere I wanted, or the dogs let us, but I was told to shy away from this one old home place up in the hills. See, before the government owned it, my great-great-grandmother's people owned it. She lived to the age of 107 and died when I was 15. She would always tell us if the dogs head to the old Rooney place, come home, the dogs will come out on the other side of the creek, or backtrack you all back out. No use, you go fooling around that place. Well, one night me and my friend Nubs, he's got nine and a half fingers due to a log splitter accident when he was ten, decided that we were gonna hunt at Hollow exclusively. Had to be a prize grade a coon up there. Nobody hunts it. We took off up the creek road on foot with three of the best dogs I've ever had, Jake. Big, broad, blue tick with a cold nose. Slim Jim, hot-nosed red tick. And Trapper John, mean, bedeviled, extremely talented hound. Now you know when you get to the Rooney place because it's this big flat at the end of the creek road with big half-dead field trees and piles of field stones about every 30 feet at random for about half a mile that gradually turns up into a draw that peters out in the face of the mountain. This is before GPS collars or any of that stuff. I used my dad's old carbide lamp to walk by, and Nubs would use his dad's old wheat miners, light to spot way up in the tree. We would let the dogs run till we heard them bellowing or those long, bald barks to signify treed and walk to the dogs and dispatch the coon. About 500 yards ahead, with a short chase, the dogs barked treed. We started walking towards them up in the mouth of the cove. Then the dogs took off again. This is not unheard of. A coon can jump tree, come down another and sneak off, and a circling dog picks up the fresh track and off they go again. This happened six more times in the next two hours. That was definitely weird. And then everything went silent. That's when I started shaking. I knew my dogs. I've watched two of them fight bear. Nothing scared them. All the dogs came back to us with tail tucked head low, quiet as hell. We were working on an exit plan when, you know, when you shake a tree limb that it's rained on all night and all the raindrops fall off all at once and hit the ground. That happened about 20 yards behind me. Only this was a big rock oak, about 75 feet to the first limb. While we were trying to see what was in that tree, damned if the same thing didn't happen to the tree we were standing under. When Trapper John pissed himself at my feet, I knew we had to get the hell out of that holla. We backed out of there and ran home as fast as we could. Never hunted near the Rooney place again. I can't say for sure what was in that tree, but to me it looked like a man running through the treetops. It was years before I ever ventured in that place in the daylight. Did a little digging at the courthouse when I was in college. Come to find out it was a logging town when the Spanish flu came through. Had a mill and everything. The flu killed so many people in that town that there wasn't enough living to bury the dead. My hometown's people went up and buried the dead. If you take a black crayon and a piece of paper and scroll it on the biggest rock of the pile, it's names of the dead buried there. My great-great-grandmother's dad bought it for four fifty off the lumber mill, burned the last of the structures, and farmed it for the rest of his life. When he died, my great-great-grandmother and her brothers sold it to the government. It's part of the Monongahela National Forest now. This was two decades ago. They used to do donkey tours in the Grand Canyon. You ride the donkey and then hike. You can camp, but we did the day tour. A woman that was probably in her late sixties, early seventies was in front of me and on an incline started to act strange. She was swaying left and right as on a steep cliff, which was very safe and wide. 
It swayed back and forth for maybe a minute, and she was slumped over, and then boom. It looked like she passed out and pulled the donkey to the left and fell over the cliff. I saw her tumble over, and then they were just gone. I can't remember how far down the fall was, but it had to be over 100 feet. Immediately, the guy had jumped off at the front, ran over and let out an audible scream before stopping after realizing she had a tour with her. A few people got off their donkey, and she stopped them from peering over. A few of the other guides looked over, and they made some radio calls, and then we proceeded. It was very obvious that something really serious had happened, but we never found out. I'm pretty sure I watched a woman and a donkey fall to their death in the Grand Canyon. During a 2010-2011 West Pass on a ADDG, we were somewhere in the Indian Ocean. This is my best guess because I was in the air dead on the ship and never quite knew exactly where we were. One night after flight ops had ended me and two other guys from the detachment were lounging on the flight deck. We had brought out those collapsible camping chairs and were just sitting there stargazing because the view was amazing with the ship not having exterior lights on. As we were looking at the stars, I noticed a pale green star moving east to west from our perspective. The best way I can think of to describe this would be that it looked like it is satellite, except this one was a pale green color and had what I can only describe as three bars in front of it. Basically, it looked like a pale green Wi-Fi signal icon traveling east to west in the sky. The bar closet to the satellite was the smallest and the next two increased in size, exactly the same as a Wi-Fi icon. All three of us on the flight deck saw it and had no idea how to explain it. My best guess is that it actually was a satellite, but I can't explain the color or the bars that radiated outward in front of it. I know it was not a meteor or something similar, as it maintained a constant speed across the sky and was the same brightness the entire time we were able to see. That was without a doubt the most unexplainable thing I've ever seen while on the ship, and to this day I still have no idea what it was. I was having a fire with some friends in northern Minnesota. Everyone was pretty drunk and talking really loud, but I saw one of my friends freeze her like he was hearing something. A few seconds later, another friend freezes like he's hearing something too, but this whole time I can't hear anything but my drunk friends jabbering away. I am the only one who notices the two getting up and start moving into a huge clearing where we were camping. Once we get out of earshot of the fire, I hear it too. I don't know how to describe what I heard. It was extremely loud, like a low-flying plane, but it was more high-pitched and the tone undulated at a really creepy interval. The sounds was traveling at a high speed across the landscape, and every five seconds the tone and undulation frequency changed. It probably covered two miles in 30 seconds, and we could hear it traveling west out of earshot. Never found out what it was. My father used to be a helicopter pilot down the south of New Zealand. When he was starting out, he would do a lot of deer shooting in very isolated spots of the country. Only recently he told me about a pretty creepy experience he had during an evening flight as he was making his way back up the country. He flew with just a spotlight, which I'm thinking would be illegal these days. Anyway, as he was approaching this small town called Hast, basically in the middle of nowhere, he saw a bright green light in the sky. Not sure how far away it was, but he said he could hear it over the sound of his own helicopter. He said it disappeared pretty quickly after seeing it. He never reported it or anything, as he didn't want people to think he was crazy. My mom lives in the middle of nowhere. Her house is pretty far down a secluded gravel driveway that you wouldn't even know was there. The closest neighbor is about a half mile away. 
One morning she was up at about 5 a.m. getting her day started when the dogs outside started going absolutely nuts, which they only do whenever someone is on the property. She tried looking outside, but it was completely dark out. Later that day, the sheriff called, his friends with my stepdad, and told them that in the early hours of the day, a man had killed his wife and was running from the cops and had abandoned his car in the woods a few miles down from where their house was. He apparently accidentally stumbled upon their property when trying to cut through the woods. They caught up to him a few miles down and had a shootout with him, and he was killed in the process. I've been an officer in our small town since well before I can even remember, but I have never experienced something quite similar to what I did last week. I don't believe in the paranormal or anything of that kind. I never have, but the logic I've been raised to apply cannot begin to explain this. I have never quite seen something as strange. I'm not sure if anybody else has either. You see, there is no rational way to try and explain it or even make it sound plausible, but please bear with me. I need to tell you the story that changed my perspective on my life. At around 8 p.m., we had gotten word from dispatch about a dispute taking place between some college kids. Apparently, it had begun as a minor disturbance and soon turned into a full-fledged physical fight. The scene was a good one. Our drive, even if we drove like NASCAR racers. It was taking place at the literal border of our area of jurisdiction, so I was sure that we were going to be plenty late to the party. No other units were available at the time either, except for us, so we got moving. This is precisely why cops get a bad rep for always being late. You know the units nearby are always busy with something for some reason. Gene, my colleague, and I drove as I sat in a seat beside him, looking out the window and listening to my growling stomach. I hadn't eaten lunch that day due to work, and I'm not somebody who can go a long time without eating. At around 8.30, still a rather large distance away from our destination, we stopped at a drive through sandwich place that had come our way. We were going to be late anyway, so stopping for a few moments couldn't possibly hurt. I would not have been surprised if the fight was already over by now and everybody had just gone home or to the hospital or whatever. I unwrapped my sandwich as Gene resumed the drive. He only had bought an iced coffee despite me telling him to grab something to eat while he had the chance. He had been with me and had not had lunch yet either. My guess was he was not hungry anyway. There we were once again, driving through the empty road in silence. The road had thick trees on either side of it and completely void of people. It was pretty peacefully, actually, minus what it followed. At around 8.50, I noticed something weird out of the ordinary. The road had been straight all this while, but somehow we passed the sandwich shop that we had bought our stuff from once again. I pointed this out to Jean, who stopped and checked. Yes, we had been driving straight on a straight road for the last twenty minutes and somehow traveled in a circle. It was that very same sandwich shop. I told him to put it on his GPS if he doesn't know the way. He reluctantly did, swearing that he had been on this road multiple times and confidently knew the way. Once again, we left the shop behind us and continued the journey. I was rather observant of the outside this time. So when the long road lined with trees opened up to reveal the same shop, I couldn't believe my eyes. Gene had noticed it, too, and pulled over. He checked his GPS, but sure enough, we were again back at the same place. I couldn't understand it. Even I had driven on this road before, and it was not, and I promise, a circular path in any way. Something wasn't right. As he mumbled in confusion, I explained to him. Please let me drive now. It was 9.10 p.m. already, and he was repeatedly coming back to the same spot. This was not helping us. Looking carefully at the GPS on his phone in front of me, I began to drive. Even though I paid as much attention to the road in front of me as I did to the GPS route showing me a straight path to the destination, somehow we ended up by the shop yet again. I started freaking out. What is happening here? 
I looked at Jean, who was clearly as disturbed as I was. I couldn't just radio into dispatch and tell them we were going through some sort of time warp. They would think we're high or on drugs or drunk, so I had to think of something. I got out of the car and went to the owner of the shop. He was an older gentleman in his later sixties, the same one, actually, who had given me the sandwich. I told him about the weird thing happening with us and asked if somebody else had experienced it before. He was rather hard of hearing, so I had to repeat myself and raise my voice quite a few times. When he finally understood what I was trying to say, he looked clueless and simply shook his head. I walked back, disappointed. The conversation had not been fruitful in any way, and we drove off yet again, swearing that if the road somehow led us to the shop once more, I'd finally radio for the backup we needed. Keep in mind that I was plenty creeped out at this point, and so was Jean. At this time, however, the road lined with trees and went on for longer and did not lead us back to the same point. When I saw the connecting roads branching out from the one we were on, I felt a sigh of relief coming on like I'd never had before. Granted, we reached our scene by 9.50 p.m. and did not see a soul, but honestly, I didn't care. We had somehow been driving a circle on a straight road for over an hour, breaking out that there was more than enough time for me. As Gene spoke to dispatch, I set the location in the GPS for the station rerouting it so we didn't have to take the same path. No way in hell was I going to go through that again. As an officer, I have seen many weird things, but I have always been able to somewhat explain it with reason and logic, irrational thinking, the strange animals, strange shapes, the paranormal, possessed people, people on drugs, gunfights, you name it, people are strange. However, something like this that feels like we were in the twilight zone, I don't know how to describe this. I've looked into this before, and the only thing that comes up is the Mandela effect, which might or might not be part of what I experienced. Either way, it's hard for me to even comprehend and acknowledge that it really happened. The GPS and my memory both are a testament to the linearity of the path we were on. Yet we had somehow been looped over and over again and talk about the twilight zone. Let me know what you think. I would love to hear your opinion on what you think happened. Thirty-five years ago, I was perched in a valley tree stand during archery season in a, an tract of hardwoods near my parents' home. This track bordered on of the state's largest mental health hospital. Growing up in the area, youth kids would build forts, etc., in the woods surrounding the hospital and occasionally run into patients who wandered off the hospital property as it had no fences. Most of the folks were harmless, but this facility did house a number of folks who were truly disturbed. Anyway, getting back to being perched in the tree stand one evening, I got that strange sensation of being watched. That feeling proved to be correct as I saw a figure moving through some thick brush on the hillside about 100 yards in front of me. Thinking it to be just be one of the wanderers, uh, I didn't pay it any mind for a few minutes. Upon just beginning to relax, I was again overwhelmed with that feeling. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man walking on the storm sewer cut behind me about 60 yards. He was wearing sweatpants, typical of the hospital patients, and a blue flannel button-down, tuppy. I wasn't sure if he had seen me or not, but I had a feeling that this man wasn't one of the harmless patients as he began to pace back and forth along a 30-yard length of the cut, speaking and cursing loudly to no one, bawling his fists and hissing, spitting like a cat. It was getting close to sundown, so I thought it best to climb down and slip out of the woods, knowing I had a steep hill climb back to the house and didn't want to alert this man to my presence as he was between me and my way out. I waited until he had walked in the direction away from me, lowered my bow and pack, climbed down, and started to do a long loop up and slightly around the hill in front of me. I dropped out of the woods against a pasture field, crested a short rise, and was surprised by the same man sitting on a fallen tree, massaging his bare feet with no shoes anywhere in sight. Mm, 
I remember thinking there's no way that guy could get here before I did. I was stuck and had no choice but to go by him. As I approached him, he looked up at me with eyes like Vincent D'Onofrio's character in the bathroom scene in full metal jacket. As casually as I could, I said hello and kept walking by. As I passed, he asked me if I was in the army and on maneuvers. I said no and kept on walking. Behind me, he hissed loudly, and that put a hop in my step. I went about one hundred yards before looking back behind me. The man was gone from the fallen tree, although I didn't know which direction he had gone. I double-timed it up the hill and out of the woods towards home. Spooked me enough that I didn't go back there any more that year, and not long after, the land was sold and a housing development sprouted up. While the man may have been harmless, his actions and me, being an 18-year-old kid at the time, still make the hair stand up on my arms as I type this. This story was told to me by my uncle, who happens to be a park ranger in Ontario. He frequently comments on how calm his work has been after pandemic, with fewer tourists visiting. However, there are still instances where he has to venture into the wilderness to check on things. One day he had to navigate through the woods with a colleague due to reports of unauthorized individuals in the area. These reports were not uncommon usually involving mean-spirited teenagers causing trouble. However, what made these reports peculiar was the description of people carrying unusual items like axes and animal skulls. It was just weird stuff, and my uncle knew that people could be pretty racist in those parts. Speculations arose that these individuals could be Algonquin people, as the park was situated on their land. The thought of unhinged people worshipping Odin in the cold wilderness of modern-day Canada seemed far-fetched, but my uncle couldn't ignore the strange occurrences. As they ventured deeper into the wilderness, they discovered odd symbols carved into tree trunks, remnants of trash, and markings on the ground. It appeared that people had been actively camping in restricted areas. However, despite their efforts, my uncle and his colleague never encountered any campers during their patrols. But there were always weird things left behind, like a cape, a helmet, and even a real sword, as if someone had been indulging in Nordic cult practices. There were also traces of incense and other religious paraphernalia. These findings only added to the mystery surrounding the area. One night, my uncle and his colleague decided to set up camp near a massive elm tree for shelter against the frigid winds that plagued the nights. They enjoyed a meal of heated beans and rice while exchanging stories. They maintained communication with a portable radio to stay connected with the base. At one point, my uncle excused himself to relieve himself in the woods while his colleague remained by the fire. As minutes passed, my uncle realized that his colleague hadn't returned. Concerned, he called out for him, but there was no response. The atmosphere in the woods had become eerily quiet, devoid of the usual sounds of the night. A faint whisper caught my uncle's attention from his right side. He strained to listen, and moved in that direction, guided by the weak voice. It sounded like his colleague, but something felt off. The woods seemed too calm and quiet, giving my uncle an unsettling feeling. He called out to the voice, growing stronger as he ventured deeper into the wilderness. Then he heard his colleague's voice calling for help. However, my uncle sensed that something wasn't right. The tone and modulation of the voice didn't match his colleague's usual manner of speaking. It was an instinctual feeling that urged my uncle to proceed with caution. Armed with his rifle and flashlight, my uncle scanned the area, searching for any sign of his colleague. Instead, he came face to face with an unimaginable sight. Standing about four or five meters away in a small clearing surrounded by tall trees was a tall, genderless figure. Its thin frame and moose skull-like head with antlers made it clear that this being was not of this world. The creature moved closer, emitting distorted and crackly sounds that mimicked his colleague's voice. Fearing for his safety, my uncle fired a warning shot into the air before turning and running as fast as he could. 
The unearthly noise that followed him was unlike anything human. My uncle ran until he realized he was lost in the dark wilderness. He had to wait for daylight to find his way back to the trail, relying only on his dying flashlight. When he finally reunited with his colleague John, it became apparent that John had experienced a similarly unsettling night. When my uncle returned to the campsite, nobody was there. John had heard my uncle's calls during the night and had also encountered strange noises that he couldn't quite comprehend. Concerned for my uncle's well-being, he waited anxiously for his return. In the morning, my uncle emerged from the wilderness, exhausted and disoriented. He recounted the events of the previous night to John. He listened intently, his worry growing with each passing word. They both believed that what they had encountered was something supernatural, possibly a wendigo. Although my uncle was not particularly religious or inclined to believe in such things, he understood the importance of respecting the rules of the wild. In the depths of the wilderness, where the line between reality and the unknown blurs, he realized that there are forces beyond our comprehension. From that day forward, my uncle and John never spoke of their encounter to anyone else. They carried the weight of that experience, knowing that some things are better left unexplained. The incident served as a reminder of the mysteries that dwell in the depths of the wilderness, hidden from the prying eyes of ordinary life. Even now, as time has passed, my uncle remains haunted by that encounter. The memory lingers, a constant reminder that there are realms and creatures beyond our understanding. It has changed him instilling in him a deeper respect for the unknown and a sense of awe for the vastness of the natural world. Though their story may seem unbelievable to some, those who have ventured deep into the wilderness understand that there are things out there that defy explanation. My uncle and John carry their experience as a testament to the mysterious and uncharted aspects of our existence, forever changed by their encounter with the supernatural. I'm going to remain anonymous for this, but I had a signing of something that I can't explain in 2011 springtime. During the time, I was working as a police officer for a small town in northwestern Oklahoma. What made me take an interest in this particular case was the description given to me by the witness. It sounded just like how other witnesses have described other abnormals to include Sasquatch. I had one individual coming to the department as they were reporting what they thought they saw. It appeared to be a man with long black hair, no shirt or clothes, standing near their pond at about one o'clock in the morning. Apparently, it looks like they were holding a knife or some sort of weapon. As he noticed them looking out their window, he began walking into the wood line, disappearing from view, nonetheless never returning only after several attempts of trying to find him by the reporting party. I'm not sure what he had actually had in his hand. I never asked him a description of it specifically, but I began to do some research on my own. I came across several websites dedicated to Bigfoot sightings where individuals could almost describe perfectly, with many others, what they had seen. In my years as an officer before retiring from law enforcement, I've come across multiple reports of unusual creatures being seen all throughout Oklahoma as well as neighboring states. In fact, just last year alone, I had another retired law enforcement officer tell me all about an experience that their own individual mother-in-law had while she lived out on a farm near Elk City. She told him about a time she had gone out to her chicken coop and had a face-to-face -to -face encounter with a small monkey-type animal standing on two feet without hair. It looked like it was wearing pants. It began making loud sounds before running away. It appeared as if it had jumped over multiple fences, only to disappear into the tree line. I also know that many people have reported seeing humanoid creatures looking similar to how. Bigfoot looked and how Bigfoot is described. All through various areas all around Elk City, Shawnee as well, and even the town I grew up in, Guthrie, where witnesses and victims claim these creatures prey on livestock, chickens, goats, pigs, everything. 
This is also not the only time I've received reports involving unusual creatures that match what has been described by the witness to include Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I'm sure these things happen all the time throughout the United States and even other countries throughout the world. However, I'm most familiar with Oklahoma, and it appears to be designated for many areas of things like this. I really doubt a lot of these stories are made up. If you got a chance to sit down and talk to these witnesses, they're terrified. Something is happening here. What could these creatures be? How does somebody prove their existence without anyone ever actually catching one? Do they really exist in different forms? The Smoky Mountains National Park felt like a universe away from the concrete jungle of New York City that I'd always called home. The air was cleaner, the quiet more profound, and the sheer expanse of wilderness was mind-boggling. Ancient trees like sentinels stood tall, their leaves whispering secrets of centuries in the wind. The forest floor was a symphony of life, crackling underfoot with every step I took. My name is Rebecca Miles, though everyone calls me Becky. I was assigned to this park as a part of my community service sentence for a minor infraction. My task was simple, to monitor the illegal logging activities that had recently spiked in the area. But the reality of it was far more complex, and soon I found myself entangled in a web of events that felt straight out of a science fiction novel. It started with strange sightings, rumors whispered among the locals about a creature that resembled the mythical Sasquatch. I brushed it off as local folklore until one evening when I crossed paths with the unimaginable. There it stood, a hulking figure covered in thick fur with eyes that held an uncanny intelligence. The encounter was brief and terrifying. It disappeared into the forest, leaving me with a racing heart and a newfound realization. The Sasquatch was real. The situation escalated when the creature, or creatures as it seemed there was more than one, started to show signs of aggressive behavior. Reports poured in about sightings near local communities of livestock missing and of an inexplicable fear among the residents. It dawned on me that the Sasquatch, like the other animals in the park, were losing their habitats due to the illegal logging. I was faced with a challenge unlike any other. Not only did I have to expose the illegal loggers, but I also had to pacify the Sasquatch and find a way to restore their habitats. The days turned into a blur of tracking the loggers, collecting evidence, and studying the patterns of the Sasquatch. The task was perilous, and many a time I found myself narrowly escaping danger. Finally, armed with enough evidence, I reached out to the police. They were skeptical at first, but the undeniable proof made them swing into action. The illegal logging operation was busted, and a plan was put in place to restore the damaged parts of the forest. The Sasquatch, however, was a more complex problem. With the help of local experts, we managed to locate and confront the aggressive Sasquatch. The encounter was terrifying and intense. It ended with the Sasquatch's death, a resolution I was not entirely comfortable with, but was deemed necessary for the safety of the local communities. The police, while grateful for my help, made it clear that the existence of the Sasquatch was to remain a secret. They threatened me with serious consequences if word got out about our discovery. As I returned to my small cabin in the heart of the forest that night, I couldn't help but feel a sense of loss. I had entered this park, a city girl with a punishment to serve, but I was leaving with a profound respect for the wilderness and its secrets. <laughs> I grew up in a small rural town nestled amidst the sprawling hills and dense forests of the Appalachian region. It was a place rich in history, with whispers of the past carried on the wind. The town had a quiet charm, its streets lined with quaint houses and storefronts, but beneath the surface there was an air of mystery and an unspoken warning that echoed through the generations. You see, our town was built upon land that once belonged to a Native American tribe, a land steeped in ancient traditions and legends. 
It was said that the spirits of the land still roamed freely, guarding their sacred grounds from unwelcome intruders. Over the years, tales emerged of white people who had ventured too far into the wilderness, never to return. It became a cautionary tale, a reminder that this land belonged to the natives, and it was dangerous for outsiders to roam free. One fateful summer, our town fell prey to a darkness that descended upon us like a shroud. A series of brutal killings began to plague our community, leaving us paralyzed with fear and disbelief. The victims' bodies were found mangled and torn apart, their lives stolen by an unknown force of unimaginable strength. Whispers of bears and wild animals circulated, but deep down, we knew there was something more sinister at play. As the terror tightened its grip, an investigative journalist named Jake arrived in our town, drawn by the disturbing reports. His determination to uncover the truth led him to team up with Ayana, a resilient Native American tracker who possessed an intimate knowledge of the land and its secrets. Together, they embarked on a treacherous journey to unravel the enigma that gripped our town. With each investigation, they discovered a chilling connection among the victims. They had all encountered a creature, a werewolf-like being that prowled a specific place deep within the wilderness. Determined to confront this elusive creature and bring an end to the nightmare, Jake and Ayana ventured into the heart of the untamed wilderness. As they neared the creature's lair, a confrontation ensued, enveloping them in a violent clash between man and beast. In the chaos, Ayana, the fearless tracker, fell victim to the creature's ferocity, her life extinguished before their mission reached its culmination. Yet Jake, fueled by grief and adrenaline, managed to land a critical blow on the creature, inflicting a wound that forced it to retreat into the shadows. Defeated but not eradicated, the creature known as the Shadow Howler vanished, leaving our town forever changed. Its haunting presence lingered in our collective memory, a reminder of the ancient power that still resided in the land. We mourned the loss of Ayana, a warrior who had given her life to protect her people, and we carried the weight of the encounter with the Shadow Howler as a solemn warning, a reminder that sometimes the darkness that dwells within the depths of the wilderness can rise up to claim even the bravest among us. I live in Pennsylvania and was doing an amateur paranormal investigation in a small wooded area. There is a large, recently built church in the area. I call the area the Broken Bridge due to having a few bridges around from horse and buggy days. The area is notorious for having high amounts of paranormal activity. Okay, main story. About five years ago, early summer, I was visiting the area with my girlfriend around sunset. We were laying in the grass next to the creek that separates the broken bridge area. Shortly, we heard this giant snap as this tree limb from pretty high up fell to the ground maybe 50 feet away from us. This figure stood up from the spot it fell and started running extremely fast and far away. The figure, the best way to describe it, was a shadowy humanoid. It was about five or six feet tall and had long, skinny limbs. But where a head would normally be, there was none. Basically picture a Slenderman-type character, just formed of shadows and headless. That's what I saw years ago. From that day on, I have come to that area at night multiple times without seeing it again. About three nights ago, two friends and I were doing an amateur paranormal investigation in the same area. Aside from seeing normal shadow people with heads and normal limbs waltzing around the area, some unexplained voices and such, nothing has stuck out and spooked me like what happened. We were standing between a field opening and a few isolated trees. These trees aren't very, very large, small enough to be climbed, but not. A lot of footing available as we've tried climbing them before. My buddy Matt chinned his flashlight at one of the trees while myself and another friend were looking away. A loud scratching slash clanking noise was heard for a second, and Matt quickly became terrified, screaming, Something just climbed that tree. Something humanoid climbed that trees. 
Side note, the tree was maybe 60 feet or so tall, and the thing was climbing from the very bottom. Spooked, we backed away and left the area. Later that night, Matt was obviously spooked, which isn't an easy thing, knowing him. Before I let his describe what he saw, I drew out the creature I had seen years ago, and his face becomes pale as he tells me that is exactly what he saw climb the tree. I have no idea what the hell this thing is, nor do I know any similar animals in the area. In central Pennsylvania, we'll get the occasional bear, deer, hell, even some runaway cows. This humanoid wasn't a bear. Neither of us believe it was. Can anyone offer insight? I guess it was the summer of 2010, maybe 2011. A friend and I went to GameStop. It was during the times when video games were important in our lives, and we went there for a midnight release. So I guess we picked up the game somewhere around 12 o'clock, a little after. GameStop's about 20 minutes from my house in Atala, Alabama. My family owns 180 acres. It's on a road called Ponderosa Road. So we leave from GameStop and we're headed home. We got a night planned of just playing the game, so we're pumped up. So you go through a hollow across the bridge windy road, but you're heading upwards to get to our house. We're all on top of that mountain, as we call it. So there's a bit in the road, a single lane road. I'd say it's probably 10 feet wide. Well, as we're coming up the hill, I don't have my brights on. I mean, I could drive that road in the dark. I've done it before when my headlights went out, but I didn't have my brights on. I'm just making my way to the house, and we go down a dip in the road, and as we go up the next hill, I notice something in the middle of the road. I just see something white, almost as wide as you would expect a human. About as wide as a human is. The only way I know to explain it, so I hit my brakes and my light illuminates it. It was a human form, but it happened so quickly that I don't know any other way to explain it. It was way taller than a human should be. My uncle played professional baseball, and he's almost seven feet tall. So is my dad. They're big, wide guys, and this thing would have made them, you know, look small. I couldn't even see shoulders. It was just like the bottom part of something white and human-like. But the crazy thing was, when we saw it as soon as I hit the brakes, it all happened so quickly. I can't tell if it had wings and threw its wings out that were larger than ten feet. How wide the road is, larger than the road is, it literally stretched its body out. I know that sounds crazy, but almost like it was putty. That's what it was more like than wing. It just, like, got extremely wide and then skinny again and shot straight up into the air. I looked at my friend and asked him, Hey man, did you see that? I knew he saw it, I, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy, and he said, Yeah, I saw it. We just didn't know what to do. I mean, it was close to my driveway, so we could just pull into the house. I was like, man, what was that? He said, You know, I don't have a clue. It was just really odd. We got into the house, made sure we locked the doors and pulled the curtains on the windows. I still don't know to this day what it could have been. I think about it from time to time, especially out working late on the railroad. It was a clear night. I mean, no fog, warm summer night. I don't understand, and you know I've brought it up to the guy that was with me since then, and he still says I don't really know and I don't like to talk about it. I didn't really feel scared. It just happened so fast I didn't know what it was. I still don't know what it was. I just don't know if I'll ever know. Last summer, my boyfriend and I were camping in the uh, Iowa Cheetah Forest off the Winona Scenic Route. We drove through a gorgeous spillway to a creek site where we had set up our camp and were laying in the hammock for the night. Next thing I know, our dog is growling this deep growl I'd never heard her make, so it caught my attention. I look in the direction she's growling in, and I see this weird humanoid figure just casually walking in the woods about 10, 20 feet away from us. It's a light gray, 
maybe white color, seven-ish feet tall, very skinny, and has an abnormally large head. Our dog barks and catches its attention. It stops for a good twenty seconds, looks at us, then carries on its way. Needless to say, we immediately packed everything up and left. We hadn't taken anything recreational that night, though I sort of wish we had now. I don't know what I saw, but it scared the ass out of me, and I'm so curious if we were the only ones to see have ever seen anything like that out there. This was years ago in South Milwaukee. was a winter day walking my dog. Overcast. I saw a dark creature sprint across the street, but it was. Not opaque. Like the edges were smoky. It seemed like it had legs, and I saw it sprint across the street and down an alley. It was maybe the size of a medium dog. Definitely seemed like it had four legs, maybe more. I did a double take, but couldn't find any trace of it. It was like it blipped into our dimension just for a few seconds. This sighting took place while I was on a fishing trip with my girlfriend, another couple, and their mom. My friends were staying at the resort cabins at one of my favorite fall fishing lakes. By the time we arrived, uh, delayed by wiring problems on my boat trailer, it was about 3 a.m. We talked until there was little reason to go to bed, just to have to get right back up to catch the morning bite. About an hour and ab a half before sunrise, my friend Wes and I decided to go for a little walk down to one of the streams that feed out of the lake. I was curious to see what the fish were doing. We both had flashlights shining them into the stream as we walked along trying to spot fish. The further we went, the more uneasy I became, and I have been in these woods all of my life and never felt like this ever. I asked Wes if he felt kind of weird. He said kind of, we decided we'd head back. We moved to a different cabin closer to the lake. After the evening fish, I returned at late light, bummed about missing a very large brown trout. I spent most of the evening listening to fish jump and looking at stars. Wes' mom went to bed first, and about 11.45 p.m., the rest of us went to bed. My girlfriend and I were not sleeping in the cabin with Wes and his family. We were sleeping in the back of a full-size Chevy Suburban, mainly because Angela and I wanted a little privacy. Angela and didn't go right to sleep. This was about an hour and a half after everyone said goodnight at the campfire. I sat up to smoke a cigarette, and I was looking out the rear side window when something caught my eye. The cabins where we were staying are not very large. There was outdoor lighting attached to the middle of the roof line of the cabin. At first I thought it was the wind moving the tree branches or bushes, but something wasn't right. I then began to realize what I was seeing. I thought maybe I was a little more tired than I thought, and that my eyes were playing tricks on me. Except the trick didn't go away. Just to make sure, I asked Angela to sit up and look around and tell me what she sees. I totally expected to look stupid and have her tell me she saw nothing. I did not tell her what I was seeing or where I was seeing it. I looked down at the floor. Angela sat up and it wasn't even two seconds before she visually locked onto the same thing I did. Still looking at the floor, I asked, What do you see? Her first word was Yeti, and with that things now felt real. We both became excited, scared, and curious. I was a bit more uneasy with how the Bigfoot was moving and acting. It was about 50 feet away back in the tree line on the other side of the cabin, about 15 feet away from West Mom's truck. It was standing just out of the light so as not be directly seen. It was about seven one and a half to eight feet tall, covered in hair, very broad in the shoulder and across the chest. It wasn't as bulky as what is in the Patterson film. What made me very uneasy was its movements and actions. It wasn't coming forward. It had one arm up above its head and to the side, resting on a tree. It was rapidly rocking from side to side and bobbing up and down. Angela made a statement about getting out to maybe get closer to it. I was in the process of telling her no, 
When the next surprise was realized, Angela points out that there's more than one. About two feet behind the tailgate of my friend's mom's truck was crouched not one, but two of what appeared to be smaller Bigfoots. They were crouched close together, sitting motionless and looking directly at us. They looked like they were younger ones compared to the big ones still rocking back and forth by the tree. They were not as broad in the shoulders or chest. Angela and I wondered what to do, quietly talking to each other for five or ten minutes. I decided to wake up Wes by yelling toward the window of his bedroom, which was in the middle of the back wall of the cabin. Wes answered back and I told him to look out his window. At first he couldn't see anything through the window. I didn't tell him what to look for or what I was seeing for fear of him thinking we were pulling a joke or that we were totally out of our minds. As he opened the window, I asked him, Do you see it? His response was, Oh my God! Wes didn't say another word, which made me even more uneasy. I couldn't deal with it anymore. I jumped up to the front seat and was gonna start up the rig to back them off a little. When I got up front, I couldn't find the keys. I became a bit panicky. I found the keys and started up the Chevy with a big vroom, and it hardly seemed to bother them. I then decided if I was going to see Bigfoot, then by God, I'm gonna try to get a good look. I was parked in such a way that I had to pull way out and swing the front end around for my lights to hit them directly. As soon as the Chevy moved, they took off back into the trees and bushes. I then headed down the road toward a picnic era where they might cross a road. On the way, Angela said she had enough and didn't want to be around the Bigfoot anymore. I turned around, ended up taking a wrong turn finding, and myself driving cross country through the cabins in the resort. I was turned around so badly I didn't know where I was. Angela spotted the cabin where we stayed the first night. I then began to drive out to the highway to leave because Angela didn't want to return until daylight. Just before I got to the highway, I remembered my friends at the cabin and the fact that they had their newborn baby with them. Angela agreed we couldn't leave them there, so we returned. Wes said that as we were driving off, something ran across the road behind us on two legs. Angela and I decided to leave the Chevy parked halfway blocking the road and go inside the cabin. After we got inside, I asked Wes if he'd seen what we saw, because I still could not take in the fact that this really happened. Wes told me he definitely saw what he believes to be a Bigfoot. He explained that he became salient because of the two smaller ones at the back of his mom's truck. After twenty minutes had gone by, I needed a smoke real bad, and Wes' mom wanted something to drink. Both were in my rig. Wes was the first to step outside. On the way back to the cabin, we heard a bunch of commotion down toward the lake, like something running through bushes, snapping and breaking limbs. We ran to the front door of the cabin. Just as we started up the steps, I fell onto the porch, scaring Wes to death. Once inside, we talked and tried to rationalize everything that had happened. Things were quiet outside from then on, other than the fact that a raccoon thumped on our door which startled us. What was strange was that the raccoon seemed to want to come into the cabin. The raccoon did not touch any of the food outside the cabin. I love camping. I try to go every summer. My family has a little cabin on Moxie Pond, right on the water. It's a couple hundred miles headed northwest and then about ten miles down the old logging roads to get to our spot. I love it. It's trees and water and no neighbors to be seen. It's quiet unless the dickhead across the pond is running his generator all damn day. There's no power. It's gas lights and stove. No plumbing. No running water other than what you pump from the lake using the old-fashioned hand pump over the sink. You do your business in the outhouse and throw some cedar shavings on it as a courtesy to the next person. My girlfriend had been together for about two years. She's more from the city, but she was excited to come with when I said I wanted to go up to camp this year. We couldn't go last year, so we packed our clothes and food and whatnot into my truck and started up. It's about a four-hour drive of about an hour and a half on the highway until you get to Shohagen, 
scow bass it's occasionally called, and then it's another couple hours driving through tiny towns that are trapped in yesteryear and falling apart. The further you get from the paper mill, the worse it looks, but the better it smells. Driving by the paper mill smells like a wet skunk fart. You'll eventually get up into the mountains. The views are amazing. Sometimes some masshole will give you plenty of time to admire them as you're trapped behind their bumper as they creep along. You eventually get to the Forks. The Forks contains Barry's General Store, Whitewater Rafting Companies, and not much else. We got up there closer to the end of twilight, so there was nothing going on. No people out. You take right, drive to the dam at the end of the lake, take a left, and you're on the logging roads. You have to go kinda slow on the logging roads. I almost kissed a young moose one year when it jumped out right beside my truck, its nose almost coming through my open window. You're surrounded by nothing but trees. The forest is so thick you can't really see past the first trees. Especially at night, I've had some weird things happen up here over the years. I've heard a blood-curdling scream in the middle of the night that sounded like a girl getting murdered. The next day, I found a half-eaten rabbit floating in the lake. That put my mind at ease. A rabbit can scream, and it'll sound just like a little girl. I've heard singing in the woods, away from the direction of any other camp. It was a beautiful, mournful song, and I didn't understand the language. That's a different story, though. I digressed. We're driving down the logging roads, and I'm quietly laughing to myself as my girlfriend clutches my arm tightly, her eyes wide. She occasionally punches my leg when I don't stifle myself well enough. I don't blame her for being scared. She's never been in woods like this before. But I warned her, and it was her fault we got such a late start anyway. So we have to drive in at night. Once you get closer to the lake, the trails get smaller and more overgrown. Birch trees, bent over from years of snow and wind, scrape their branches over the top of the truck, occasionally blocking my vision. There's always maintenance to be done. I'm used to my eyes playing tricks on me. So I didn't think anything of seeing the shadows moving around us. I just wrote it off as being a trick of the light as the front of my truck bounced on the wretched road. My girlfriend would occasionally gasp and whimper and say, what the if is that? Finally, I just had her put her head in my lap, and I played with her hair as I drove, constantly telling myself that the figures and shapes I see are just trees and shadow. This isn't my first time doing this. I get a little turned around in the dark, but we get to camp, okay? I let her put her head back up, and I take her in my arms and comfort her before we get out telling her that nothing weird has ever happened up here. It's a lie, but I only have to get her out of the truck and into the camp. I grab my flashlight and get out and walk over to her door. I open it for her, grab her bag, and walk her into the camp. I get the gas going and turn the lights on, sit her down in the comfy chair, hand her her book, and go to get the rest of the stuff out of the truck. We're moved in, and I make us dinner while she reads. Safe inside. She's calmer now, but she did have me close the blinds to the double slider at the front of the camp. I was going to, anyway. During the day, it's a wonderful view of the lake, but at night, the fear is always at the back of my mind that I'm going to look at them and see something standing on the porch, looking in. We eat, we enjoy the privacy and each other, and we go to bed. We stay in the camp for a couple days. There's nothing that needs doing. We read, we swim. We F, we take the kayaks out and visit the islands. I tried to get her to just be naked while we're alone up here, but no luck. I brought a tent because I'd like to spend a night right out in the woods, but it's hard to convince her at first. But after a couple nights spent drinking by the fire without anything weird happening, she's more inclined to try it, as long as I bring my shotgun, which I was going to do anyway. I've never had an encounter with a bear or wolves up here, and we didn't hear any howling, but I'm not staying in the woods unarmed. It's the third or fourth night when we go out. We don't go far because I know better than to just wander off into the woods. We stay in sight of the big tree beside camp. We can't see the camp. We can't hear the water. 
but we find a nice flat spot in a small clearing, and I put the tent up. You can probably imagine how we then spent the rest of the day. We'd had hot dogs and s'mores over the fire that night, and then I put the fire out and we staggered to bed. She fell asleep quickly. I didn't sleep so well. I feel like I was in and out all night, more caught in the in-between world than actually asleep. I felt her get up and saw the muted light from her hand covering the flashlight, but I couldn't react or say anything. I'm not sure I didn't dream it. She went out, and after a minute, she came back in with the light off. She laid down and was out again. I still couldn't move, so again, I'm not sure I didn't dream her going out. My dreams are generally this not exciting, but I know I woke up when I heard her voice from outside the tent, her face on the other side of the fabric. A desperate and terrified whisper. You need to get out of there. That's not me. Get out. We need to get back inside the camp. My blood ran cold and my eyes opened. At least I think they were open. I couldn't see a thing. I sat up and went to reach for my shotgun, just in case. But I felt her hands wrap around me and gently pull me back down. She whispered, Where are you going? And I just froze. I let her pull me back down as my mind raced. My thoughts were like a broken mirror tumbling around in a dryer, smashing into each other and splintering even more. I said nothing. I just laid down and listened. My girlfriend still had her hands lightly across my chest, and she seemed to have fallen asleep again. I laid there in the dark, straining to hear anything other than her breathing. There was nothing. I had to chalk it up to dreaming. But I also had to look before I could go to sleep. I started to get up again. But again, she pulled me down and got on top of me, aggressively kissing me. She didn't go to bed naked. She always wears pajamas. She wore some light blue pajama pants and one of my shirts to bed. But they're gone now, though. I wear nothing to bed, so it was easy for her to get what she was after. It's exceedingly rare for her to initiate. That's almost always been my job. She's always an eager participant, but I think this was maybe the third time in two years that she initiated herself, and she put herself on top, and she was aggressive. I'm not complaining about not having to do the work or the enthusiasm, but all three together is like finding a unicorn. A unicorn, as she did her thing. I eventually put what happened out of my mind and finally got my head in the game, thanking the alcohol. After we finished, she immediately got up and went outside. I figured she just had to pee, but she didn't bring a light. She never just gets up right after. We always just lay there for a while. She left the flap open. I'm sure because she was coming right back. I noticed I couldn't hear anything at all. Not that I was trying to hear her piss. I just figured that she wouldn't be concerned about it and go too far from the tent in the dark. After a couple minutes, I heard her footsteps returning. She came through the flap and was already on her way to laying down before her feet were inside. I followed the sound and caught her in my arms. She was dressed again. I was going to ask her why she left her clothes outside, but she was asleep by the time her head hit my chest. I kissed her forehead and rolled her off of me so I could zip up the tent flap. Then I laid down, absolutely exhausted and at some point I fell asleep while listening to the absolutely nothing going on in the woods around us. I thought it strange, but I just figured it was because we were out here. The next morning I made pancakes and bacon over the fire for us. I mentioned the happenings last night, and she just looked at me quizzically. She couldn't remember any of it. She only remembered waking up to pee, taking the light, and then just going back to the tent and crashing again. She's not superstitious, so she just blamed the alcohol and was happy that she made me happy, and that was that. After breakfast, I started to break down the camp. I packed up some things for her to take back, pointed out the tree by camp, and sent her on her way. I watched her walk away for a minute because I just enjoy watching my girlfriend walking away. She disappeared into the woods, and I set about breaking the tent down and getting it packed up. It went slower than I would have liked. You have to get everything just right if it's going to fit in its respective bags again. After struggling for a bit and scratching my head, I became aware that I wasn't alone. I turned around and there was my girlfriend. 
just looking at me. In broad daylight, she was naked again. My eyes lit up, and she giggled at my face, then crossed the distance to me without a word. She used the rolled-up tent to kneel on for about twenty minutes, then just got up and walked off in the direction of camp. I'll admit, I was starting to have a hard time keeping up with her. Not that I was complaining, but I was feeling exhausted after every time. I finally got everything put away and went back to camp. I sat down and read for a little while before finally succumbing to a nap, sitting in the comfy chair in the sunlight, facing out the sliders. I woke up to my girlfriend getting touchy after me again. When we were done, I immediately passed out. I woke up sometime in the mid-afternoon to wind and rain. I'm not sure when. We don't have a clock at camp. My girlfriend had moved to the couch, reading. She was in just her underwear. I didn't know what prompted this change in dress code and appetite. I thought it was weird, but I was also happy about it. I started picking things up as we were leaving the next morning. I went in the bedroom to gather any clothes. Her blue pajama pants and my shirt weren't anywhere to be seen. I asked about them, and she said they were already packed. I went outside to take a leak. The winds were getting stronger now, and occasional fat raindrops would slap against my body. I could just barely hear my girlfriend calling my name, so I shook it off and went back inside to find out what she wanted. She was still sitting on the couch, reading. I asked if she was calling for me. She just looked up and shook her head. I reminded myself that sometimes my imagination gets the better of me and just put it out of my mind. That night, she didn't let me go right to sleep, but I crashed hard after. I woke up with a mild headache early in the morning. I had to pee again. I turned on my flashlight and covered it, leaving just a sliver of light. My girlfriend sat up and looked at me, so I turned the light towards her. Her eyes looked white and cloudy. I uncovered the light and she blinked from the brightness and her eyes were back to normal. She cursed me for blasting her in the face with a light and I apologized. I told her what I was doing and to just go back to sleep. She told me to hurry back. The storm had passed. I walked outside to the tree line. I shined the light through the trees while I relieved myself, just in case. The beam fell upon a patch of upset earth, all scratched and dug up. It wasn't far into the woods, so I walked over to it. Something had obviously gotten eaten. There was blood everywhere. I couldn't really make out any tracks. It just looked like there was a lot of thrashing and kicking involved. But it was weird that there wasn't a carcass and it was weird it had happened so close to camp. If the body had been dragged off into the woods, I wasn't going to go looking for it. The next morning, we got ready to go and headed out. We talked about the weekend, but she seemed to have a spotty memory of it. I didn't think she had that much to drink. She kept herself entertained with me for most of the ride home. She'd never done that before, even when I asked for it. I was finally starting to think with the head attached to my shoulders. Her personality was different, at least when it came to sex. But aside from that, she still acted like she always had. I wasn't sure what to think. All she would say when I'd ask why she wasn't nearly as inhibited anymore was I got over it, delivered with a shrug and a smile. It's been a few months now, and her appetite is still high. I'm having a harder and harder time keeping up with her. I'm just getting tired more often. I've noticed I'm getting white hairs, and I just feel older. I'd talk to my doctor about it, but I can't afford that. I try to tell her I'm tired, but she always brings it out of me, and then I crash immediately after. And she always seems to have more and more energy. I don't know if I can keep doing this. I couldn't even write this in peace. Does anyone have any idea what's going on? I live in the Yukon, and by my house is a wilderness trail. Great trails leads to a bunch of lakes. I take my dog on the trails every day. Usually I have to walk him for at least two hours because he's part husky and has energy for days. Getting him to turn around any earlier than an hour is a nightmare. One day we're headed to the trails. Doesn't seem like anyone else is around. Seems quieter than usual. We're maybe ten minutes into our walk, and we're on a trail that is completely surrounded by trees. My ears popped for some reason, 
and it seems like the whole world's audio is turned off. Something also feels off. I look down and my dog, who normally barks his ass off at all and any wild animal is crouched down, hackles up completely silent and just looks up at me with distinctly fear-filled eyes. We turn around and he is pulling me back towards the house. He runs into my room and hides under the bed. He will not come out. He's under there for a few hours. When he did come out, he just sat staring out the window with his hackles up. He refused to go outside all night. Eventually, he got over it and relaxed, but even years later, he won't go down that one path. This happened circa 1970. One or 1972, when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Monte Vallo, Alabama, close to Birmingham. My mother is the oldest of five children. She has three sisters and a brother who is the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles, so seven people total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare, and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembers the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged a woman's body out of the car, and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he was dragging her out of the car. She must have known him. Mm. So my grandfather cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seats right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see that he was carrying a rifle but everyone was careful not to give away what they had just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he had just taken his family out for some target practice with a rifle. The man told him to have a nice a day and continued driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming, He killed that lady! He killed that lady! My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one other thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work, just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop. The sun hung low in the sky, casting an amber glow over the vast expanse of the Iowa swamp. It was a place shrouded in mystery where murky waters intermingled with gnarled trees and dense vegetation. 
Stories circulated among the locals, whispers of encounters with unknown creatures that prowled the dark recesses of the marshland. Amidst this eerie backdrop stood William, a seasoned hunter with a weathered face and a steely resolve. He had heard the tales, but to him, they were just stories, folklore spun to amuse and entertain. With his hunting troop by his side, he ventured deep into the remote hunting ground, surrounded by the treacherous swamp. Their boots sank into the spongy ground as they forged their way through the dense vegetation. The air hung heavy with anticipation, mingling with the scent of decaying leaves and damp earth. The team of hunters, armed with rifles and years of experience, were ready for the thrill of the hunt. As they pressed forward, the swamp seemed to come alive. Strange footprints imprinted in the mud, larger than any known creature. Unsettling growls echoed through the trees, reverberating in their chests. A shiver ran down William's spine, his instincts telling him that they were being watched. The atmosphere grew increasingly tense, their nerves stretched thin. Shadows danced in the fading light, playing tricks on their minds. Suddenly, a blood-curdling roar pierced the stillness, freezing them in their tracks. Eyes wide with fear, they glimpsed the silhouette of a monstrous creature lurking amidst the murky depths. The predator struck with ruthless precision, picking off the hunters one by one. Panic set in as they realized the perilous situation they were in. Trapped within the treacherous swamp, they were pawns in a deadly game of cat and mouse. William's heart pounded in his chest as he fought to stay one step ahead of the relentless beast. He relied on his instincts, his survival skills honed through countless encounters in the wilderness. With each passing moment, the creature's presence grew more suffocating, its pursuit unyielding. As hope dwindled, William's resilience kicked into overdrive. He led the remaining hunters through treacherous marshes and tangled undergrowth, using every trick in his arsenal to outsmart their relentless stalker. Exhausted and battered, they stumbled upon an abandoned cabin in a clearing. William pushed open the creaking door, his eyes scanning the interior. Dust danced in the beams of sunlight that filtered through cracked windows. As he explored the desolate cabin, he stumbled upon a weathered journal, its pages yellowed with age. With trepidation, he read the haunting entries. The journal chronicled the disappearances of hunters throughout the years, listing over fifty names of those who had ventured into the swamp, never to return. The reality of their dire situation settled heavily on William's heart a mix of sadness and determination washing over him. He vowed to honor the fallen, to share their story, and raise awareness of the lurking menace within the swamp. With newfound resolve, he gathered the remnants of his hunting troop and made a desperate bid for survival, using the knowledge gained from the journal to navigate the labyrinthine marshland. William emerged from the swamp, battered and bruised, but with a sense of purpose, he carried the weight of the lost hunters upon his shoulders, determined to expose the existence of the malevolent creature that had claimed so many lives. The sorrow in his eyes was a testament to the price paid in the pursuit of adventure in the unyielding power of the untamed wild. I was ten years old in 1972 or 1973, just a kid with a whole lot of chores, one of which was to check the mailbox. Our mailbox was a bit of a walk from the house, and Gracie, my mother's doc shunned, loved to accompany me on these little adventures. It was a summer afternoon, and Gracie and I were on our way to the mailbox when we noticed a coyote lying beside it. As we got closer, the coyote started jumping around as though it wanted to play. Gracie, ever the sociable one, started yapping excitedly and wagging her tail. I scooped her up and rushed back home, heart pounding in my chest. The following day, it was the same scene. The coyote was there, seemingly waiting for us, and it began its playful jumping routine as we approached. On the third day, I got complacent. I wasn't paying as much attention as I should have been, and Gracie saw her opportunity. She bolted from my grasp and ran towards the coyote. 
two larger coyotes emerged from the high grass and carried her off before I could react. I was left standing there, helpless. A few days later, I was heading to check the mail again. Life continued, even if your heart was breaking. That's how things were back then. I was shocked to see the same coyote sitting in the same spot. As I got closer, it started jumping around as if it wanted to play. This time, it wanted to play with me. I remember moving from the city a few months before this incident. Gracie would always jump up to go with me any time I went outside. My grandmother, till the day she died, believed that Gracie took those walks to protect me. I guess, in her own way, she did. She taught me the harsh realities of life in the wild, a lesson I'd carry with me for the rest of my life. I was walking the dog around my Pembroke Pines, Florida neighborhood, and came around a curve in the sidewalk street. I noticed something unusual and stopped walking, staring at it, trying to figure out exactly what I was seeing. The dog seemed more annoyed I'd made him stop. He did not bark or react in any way. There was a figure ahead of me about 30 feet away, standing in the swale area between the sidewalk and the street. It was not facing me. It was skeletal, thin or bony, taller than my five feet three frame with white or light grayish skin and no hair. There was something blue near its left ear. At first, I thought maybe it was a spiritual type of being, but clearly was not human. It sensed I was staring at it, looked over its right shoulder, looked at me, and then looked down at the dog. Then it suddenly started to run, into the middle of the street and then down the street and into the next block. Its knees were backward. As it ran, it began to gradually fade, like the edges were the only part of it that I could see. It was glimmering and fading until I couldn't see it anymore. A friend suggested it sounded like an insect, type alien or praying mantis alien. I'm in my late fifties. I don't drink or get stoned. And this is not a Halloween prank. I would really love to know if anyone knows what this might be. There is this thing that has been seen on Palm Island, Florida for decades is just one of the many evil, scary things that are there and shows itself when it wants to. Well, this one particular thing is pure evil. It shows itself to people wearing a dark trench coat. Not many have seen its face, but my brothers have. It follows them throughout the community, always at night, always wearing the coat. You see, on Palm Island, if you want to go somewhere, you just walk. No matter what the time is, if you want to get home, you just walk. And the streets are pitch black, with no street lights. So it would follow them. This thing is huge, bigger than any man, and scary as heck. It would always keep the same distance behind them, and in the darkness of the night, all they would hear is the sound of its hoof walking on the road. When they'd make it home, it would torment them all night, running on the roof or banging on the walls and under the house. Then when they are asleep, it shows itself to them in its true form. It comes to them in their nightmares. My brothers all described it the same way. It looks like the thing from Jeepers Creepers. Mind you, it's been after them way before the movie came out. It's big with this monstrous face, uglier and more grotesque than you can imagine. It's got hooves, long claw, like fingers and enormous wings, which it uses to chase them. Every time it's chased them, it's always caught them. My brother said he even tried in a nightmare to jump off a cliff. He said he'd rather die than let it take him, but as he jumped off the cliff, and as it was falling, all he could hear was the sound of wings. All of my brothers see this thing and have been for decades now. It stands up in the darkness, holding a rope, trying to make them commit you know what. In other times, it's tormenting them to a point where they can't sleep. If they do, it goes to them in their dreams. I know my brothers are not the only ones on Palm Island that see it. This thing just roams around Palm Island freely.
Several years ago, I believe I had an encounter with a small humanoid or juvenile Sasquatch. I can't say for sure due to the lack of visuals. It was fairly late in the evening, I'd say around 9.30. I don't know the month or year anymore, but it was at least ten years ago and the weather was cool, maybe early spring. I was working on cleaning up the property. I buy and recondition old items to sell. So I'm always cleaning up a mess. As usual, I was also in a hurry. It was dark, and I was following a route in the yard I knew in the dark. After several trips putting trash in cans and putting things away, I tripped over a stack of two tires. The trouble was I knew immediately those tires had been moved from a previous spot a couple of feet away. I busted my ass. After I hit the ground, I just paused and slowly sat up and leaned back with the top of my head resting on the back of an old Ford pickup. At that point, I looked down the side of another old Ford that was right behind the one I was leaning my head on. As I was looking, I was staring across the street, neighbor's outside light. It was angled so that it would shine right in my eyes from where I sat. As I did this, a small hairy head popped out from behind the truck behind the one I was leaning on. I could only see a profile due to the lights, but it was hairy. If it was proportional, it was short. I could have sworn I saw it shake, as if silently laughing, then poof, gone. I just sat there and out loud, in a normal voice, said, No way. That was the only visual I had, and as I said, it was limited. I've had smells that were horrible drift by once in a while. Rocks are tossed onto metal roofs. Nights where I know I'm being watched. Slaps on my house were heard by my girlfriend while I was out of town. Slaps on my neighbor's house. I live in Roy City, Texas. I'm not way out in the boonies, but not in town either. We are just east of Dallas, Texas. We are near the Trinity River Valley. If they are anywhere, they are there. Maybe you have other reports from this area from several years ago. Just glad to tell someone. I was camping with my Boy Scout troop in Alpine, New Jersey when I was in early 8th grade, November of 2010. I stepped out of the cabin in the middle of the night to take a piss and went out and did my business. I stood outside for a second, taking in the campsite. I was standing by a picnic table and glanced around. The moon was so bright that it made the sky look dark blue rather than black, and there was a light fog ominously cascading along the campsite. I heard a rustling in some bushes and didn't think much of it at first, but it continued and got louder. Slowly, I moved my flashlight along until I got to the source of the noise as it got louder and louder. I looked over and saw something that I still don't quite understand. To be honest, this thing was gigantic. Standing on hind legs, he was tall and had a muscular body with fur that looked to be black dark gray. He had the head of a dog wolf only thicker, and the weirdest part, yellow eyes. I stared at him and he stared at me. And then he just vanished, ran away faster than I could even blink. I was so bewildered that I blacked out for a minute and had to sit down, but I went back to the cabin and tried to go back to sleep. I managed to block it out of my mind for a while. Repressed memories is the term, I believe, but it eventually resurfaced when I watched an episode of Monster Quest about werewolves. This doesn't really bother me anymore, truthfully. I actually think it was pretty damn cool. Almost like the setting for a perfect horror movie, lol. The funny thing is, I feel like this thing didn't want to see me any more than I wanted to see him. It's as if we looked at each other and just silently agreed to say nothing, leave each other alone, and then act like all this shit never happened. I personally don't buy into all that transformation. Bark at the moon BS. I think werewolves are more of an undiscovered species. I stayed with the troop for a while after making Eagle to help mentor some younger scouts, and while I'll always be known as the fun leader, probably due to being closer in age, I still always stress to them that the buddy system is mandatory at all times. 
because my night could have been much different if this wolf creature I saw was a little more on the confrontational side. Cue the creepy organ music, lightning crackling evil laugh and wolves howling. This was in Meridian State Park, and it isn't spooky, just kinda weird and terribly short. I went to a small private school, and every year we would do a camping trip to Meridian. Nothing odd ever really happened until my senior year. I had a cot right next to the door of the cabin. For whatever reason, I bolted straight up in my bed, wide awake, to see a man standing just inside the entrance of the cabin. He was dressed in what I can only describe as something that would resemble a Spec Ops character out of a video game. I remember thinking, what the, uh, if this dude is military, and I noticed quite clearly his eyes glowed red, not like demonic red or anything supernatural, more like he had on glasses or goggles that put up a red light. Being 17, a martial artist, and uh, do you even lift bro kind of guy. Back then I started to say WTF, but he just raised one finger to his lips like to silence me and said sure. Next thing I know I am waking up and it is morning. Some of the other guys had said they thought they had seen someone in the woods earlier the day before, but ignored it as shadows. Nothing was taken. No one was harmed, still no clue what that was all about, but here twenty-something years later, I still remember it, vividly. I've met a few bears camping. In Alberta, we have three types of bears, brown, black, and grizzly. I learned that what to do when you encounter each kind is different. I just know grizzlies are badass mean. I met a brown cub once, but I didn't know if it was a grizzly or not. We were way up north, roughing it camping, and I came upon it in the tree. My uncle tied our food up in to keep it away from bears. This cub was having a good meal of my supper, but I knew his mama was probably nearby, so I froze and had no idea what to do. I was a 12-year-old girl at the time. My uncle trained sled dogs and had a retired husky wolf with us for protection. Not the kind of dog you can pet because he was a grouch. Anyways, I'm standing stiff as a board when his dog, named Bear, ran over and growled at the bear cub. It claimed down the tree and ran off. At this point, I started running and could hear something chasing me. Then it ran by me. It was the dog. I thought the mama bear must be chasing it, so I just ran harder, and, but she didn't end up eating me or chasing me, so that was nice. I stayed closer to the dog the rest of the trip, even though he didn't seem to like me. This happened to me and a group of friends during the summer of 2019. I'm not a great writer, and my memory of the events might be hazy, so I, I don't know if I can do this story justice, because it was actually pretty terrifying for me at least. Also, I don't know if this is even paranormal, but I've never had an experience like this before in my life, and it's made me reconsider what I think when I hear other people's experiences and stories as I never used to believe. Last year I started hanging out with a few friends I went to high school with, playing Smash, eating pizza and the like. We usually would get together around 10.30 p.m. as most of us work during the day because we don't have classes during the summer. One night we decided to go to the nearby park, probably around midnight, to run around and whatnot as teenagers do. They told me that sometimes they would see what they thought was a homeless guy hanging around the park or in the woods around the park, but they never got too close to him. They would jokingly refer to him as the sludge walker, because that's the sound the wet ground would make when walking around in the park at night. The first time I go with two other people, I'll call them Mark and John, Mark is my close friend who I've known for a long time and the only one I was really familiar with in this group. He knows I'm kind of afraid of the dark in jokes about how creepy the sludge walker is. 
At this point, I have no reason to be afraid, so I laugh it off as him screwing with me. We get to the park and sit at the pavilion, run around the soccer fields, talk shit, act. Eventually, we run around the woods and meet back at the pavilion. After a couple minutes, Mark flips and tells us to start running. We do so thinking the cops are coming as they sometimes patrol the park at night. When we are out of the park, Mark says he saw something coming out of the woods and it looked like a really tall dude. I call BS and think he's just screwing with me and trying to give us a cool story to tell the rest of the friends in that group. Fast forward a few weeks or so, they convince me to go back to the park. This time we intend to look for the sludge walker and see who or her or what it is. This time there are four of us and we split into two groups. We decide to go Mark and John, Paul and I. Paul was like me in that neither of us used to believe in the paranormal or cryptids or anything like that. We are walking onto a path in the woods that surrounds the park and we hear a few twigs snap. I say that it's probably deer or, or some shit and we continue on. All of a sudden something drops down from the tree canopy and scares the shit out of us. It was a bat, go figure. But as we continue into the woods farther, Paul stops me and says to listen. We hear some leaves rustling behind us and I reach to get my flashlight out. I don't see what's in front of us, but Paul does. As I'm fumbling with my phone trying to get the flashlight, Paul hits the deck so I do as well. Then we hear something running up the path away from us. The footsteps were fast and sounded very heavy. I am freaking out at this point because I thought we were going to get mugged by some guy who was catching some Z's in the woods. It doesn't come back and we call the other group of people and hightail it out of the park. Paul says he saw the thing and it looked really tall with a hunched back and really long fingers. Again, I call bus because that's every scary monster trap mixed into one and I brush it off as a homeless guy again. A few days later and we're all hanging out again. They say we should go back into the woods and check it out again. I disagree because I don't want to come across homeless guy again. Again I give in to peer pressure and my own curiosity and end up going with them. This time we all stick together and are making our way through the woods and we hear it. As if from every creature horror movie you've ever seen. Everything is dead silent when suddenly this screeching erupts from the path behind us and we all book it as fast as we can out into the open. We are all freaked out, but Mark and John decide to run back into the woods and get a recording of this thing. They took a video even though it was dark and you can't see anything, but you sure can heat it. I am freaked out and none of us can figure out what this is. My sister hypothesized that it could be a fox screaming, as they make a sound kind of like that, but we think this sound is polyphonic, two pitches at once. So we're all stumped. You know the drill by now, Mark. John and I are hanging out again, and it's raining. I want to go back this time, as I want to get to the bottom of this. Finally, the rain lets up at about 3 a.m., and we suit up for a muddy trek and head out. Probably the worst mistake I could make is what happened next. I still can't wrap my head around and I still can't sleep in complete darkness. We're in the park and almost immediately we see someone very tall walking out from under the pavilion. He, uh, it's coming right as us as the light from the pavilion illuminates the figure walking at us. We run behind some tall bushes as I speculate it could be a cop park ranger coming to bust us for trespassing. We decide to take a peek and creep along the edge of these tall bushes. When we round the corner, we see it standing fully upright, just a few feet in front of us. I didn't really get a good look at it, but I saw really long fingers and some sort of cloth draped across its body, and it was at least seven feet tall. We all start running, and me being a total wuss, start actually screaming. I don't think I've ever ran faster in my entire life. I looked back a few times to see if it was following us and it was just walking along the bush line. I also noticed that it had multiple glowing eyes that were glowing a faint red color, which was the only way I could tell where it was. My adrenaline was going so hard I couldn't tell if it was making noise or not. I've never gone back and I don't intend to. 
I sometimes think that it was a homeless guy or someone who lives by the park screwing with us because I don't really believe in the paranormal. But this is something I really can't e explain any other way. Mark theorized that it could be a skinwalker or a wendigo from urban legends. When I do tell people about this, I usually leave out the part about the glowing eyes as it just sounds stupid and crazy, but that's the part that keeps me from believing that it's just some guy. Everyone wants to have a weird or paranormal experience, but when you actually do, it sticks with you and can really mess with your head in the long term and in my case makes a 20-year-old sleep with a nightlight. If you actually read this and you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. This is my first Reddit post, so I'll do my best to get back to you. This is going to sound totally unbelievable, but I swear I saw something like a flying monkey last night. I was driving on a neighborhood street, and this strange animal was on the roadway. I could see its head, and it looked like a monkey to me, but it was small, like the size of a prairie dog or gopher. I kept saying, what is that? I drove around it as it would not move, possibly dazed by my headlights. My friend thought it was a possum until we passed it, and we both said that wasn't a possum. I quickly turned around, and all I saw were huge wings, way too big for that animal, flying away. Now, obviously, I said that had to be an owl or whatever it was just got snatched up by a giant owl. The problem is that this thing had a head and a neck, and it was standing on two feet, leaning forward, staring right at the car, and didn't move. I am so confused as to what I saw, even though I was so close to it. I mean, I see owls all the time. Big ones, too. I know what they look like. That thing in the road, if it was an owl, was a mutant owl. Even if I admit it was probably an owl, its wings were still far too big for its size. I have no idea what I saw, but I, I swear it looked like a small monkey to me. I live in Florida, and although I live near Jacksonville, northeast Florida. In South Florida, there was a Walmart that had monkeys living in the parking lot due to owners letting them escape. So it is possible that it was an escaped tiny monkey, although extremely unlikely. But wings? The whole thing was so confusing. I recently had an experience that I'm, I'm just not sure about. I tried explaining it to my sister, and I can't even put into words everything that happened, how I felt, and everything. I feel I can share this here anonymously, created this profile just to share this. I don't want people to think I'm crazy. I mean, I feel crazy when I discuss it, but I have to tell someone who might understand. So recently, I went on a bit of a road trip and visited a bunch of places in the southwest Utah and Colorado and Arizona and Southern California. I stopped at a park in Colorado that I hadn't initially planned on going to but had never been to, a place well known for its Native American history, various different tribal affiliations over time. That was absolutely beautiful. Honestly, it was amazing and humbling to see the history of the people here. It made me realize that there was so much more about American history than the rather Eurocentric view of colonialism I was taught. Anyways, it was amazing, given that this was November and very off season, half the park was not accessible and attendance was minimal. There were other people, but overall, it was very quiet. I had been viewing some building ruins atop the Mesa, one huge multi-room building, and not that far away, another large building, with a very large kiva in the middle, and on the southern side of building two was a solstice carving on the wall. I was walking around the smaller solstice building as there was a couple walking around the large building, and I enjoyed the quietness of being alone, and when I went to the large building, they went to the solstice building, and then they left, and I was going back to the solstice building to get some more pics of the solstice marker. I was now alone, 
It's hard to describe exactly what I felt and how everything went down, but I'll try. It was a pretty nice day, temp in the upper 50s. I'm from the Midwest, and that still shorts weather to me. Some light small clouds, but not many. Pleasant breeze and a few birds chirping away, and more than a few chipmunks all over. As I walked around the solstice building, everything became just, still. Like the wind stopped, the animals went silent and disappeared. It was just weird. There was a large, darkish cloud that came candy out of nowhere and just hung there. It was a weird heaviness all over. And there was this smell of like what I thought, just a dead animal. Like that sickly, sweet smell of rotting meat. I assumed that there was like a dead deer or rabbit or something nearby that the wind had been blowing the smell away, but the wind was gone and everything was just, still and heavy. As I reached the solstice marker wall, I noticed that on top of the wall, mind you, the walls are only too high or so, there was a piece of pottery. I swear that this pottery hadn't been there before, and it wasn't there in any of my first set of pictures looking back. It was a large broken piece, but now that I think back, it was really clean. The blacks and whites very clear. I went and picked it up to get a closer look, and it really was beautiful. A kind of stair pattern, and then an angled set of lines. It was really pretty, but it felt weird, oddly heavy for its size. And I wanted to keep it. I wanted to take it and just kept staring at it for what felt like. God, it's so hard to describe how I felt, but time stood still, and... All I wanted was this pottery. Even now, thinking about it, I still get this weird, like, longing feeling for it. And as I held it, everything was just silent and heavy, and that smell was just so strong. But suddenly there was this huge raven out of nowhere. Legit on the wall, like five feet from me, was the largest bird I've ever seen in the wild. This huge raven just cawed and flapped its wings, and I kind of snapped back to reality. Honestly, this raven was bigger than a friggin' condor. Its body was easily three tall, and its wingspan just massive. I put the pottery piece down on the wall, back where I picked it up from, and just looked at this bird, and the bird just looked back at me, and I turned and walked away. Just like that, the dark clouds blew away, and the wind returned, and there were other birds chirping, and the smell was gone. Actually, the smell all but vanished when the giant raven appeared. I got like ten feet away from where I had been standing, just around the corner of the solstice ruins, and I turned around to see the raven. They've always been beautifully intelligent birds to me, and it was gone. I didn't hear it flap its wings to fly away, and I didn't see anything in the sky. It was just gone. So was the piece of pottery, no longer on the wall. I went back to my car and headed back to the visitor center, as besides being totally weirded out over what happened, it was getting late in the day, and I had a fair bit of driving to do to get to my next stop down in Arizona. I had a good 35-minute drive back to the park entrance to reflect on what had happened and how weird I felt. Honestly, I felt like I had downed a bunch of Benadryl. I was so foggy until the raven showed up. Even now, I just really can't explain everything I felt. When I got to the visitor center, I was the only person in the visitor center proper, besides the employees, and one guy was leaving as I entered. In the gift shop, I was getting a mug. I get a mug from each park I visit, and was talking to the park ranger and the cashier, who was an older American Indian woman. She later told me her mother was Southern Paiute, and her father Navajo, about how awesome the park was, how I wished I had learned. About more of these cultures in school, etc., when I told them about the piece of pottery, I also said something like, Oh, yeah, up at the far view sites. There's a dead animal, too. When the wind dies down, you can smell it. And the park ranger and the cashier kind of quickly looked at each other and then back to me. The cashier asked if the smell came before the pottery piece, and I said, Yeah, the wind stopped, and the animals were all quiet and basically told them everything I said above. 
I didn't tell them how much I wanted to take the pottery home. I didn't want to sound crazy or admit to how much I wanted to steal an artifact from a national park. But I did tell them how heavy everything got, how silent and still and stuff, and they just looked at each other a few times and kept quiet except when I told them how this huge ass raven appeared the cashier, let out a little gasp. When I finished my story, they had a few questions about the timing of things, how long everything lasted and in what order everything happened and to describe the pottery and stuff, and all of a sudden, the cashier asked, Would you like some tea? I love tea and was like, Actually, that sounds wonderful. Thank you. And she went to get some hot tea. The ranger and I walked back towards the employee break room down the hall past the artifact restoration exhibit, and she asked where I was from and what I knew about the area, and I told her how truly minimal I had known about the various native cultures, even those closer to my Midwestern home. When the cashier returned, she handed me a cup of sage tea, and she asked if I was honest about what happened. I was really confused and said, yeah, and she told me to drink. The tea tasted kind of like a no-salt vegetable stock. I wish I had some honey and lemon. But the lemon probably would have made it taste like chicken stock, then ha-ha. And they told me about what they think I'd been near. Apparently, they hear a few different stories concerning skinwalker activity throughout the year, but none where someone sees the raven, and that's why they were telling me this. The cashier proceeded to tell me a bit about skinwalkers and how sometimes they curse objects to lure unsuspecting people in. She also said that the fact that the raven appeared and removed whatever enchantments I felt was very important that someone greater than us was watching out for me at that moment because even though skinwalkers can choose many different animal forms, even they would never appear as a raven due to the spiritual importance of these birds. She said something about they carry messages from beyond our reality in their midnight wings, and if the raven appeared to me, they could share certain information with me that they never share with anyone. She told me that the sage would help cleanse me of any remnants of the skinwalker's tricks and suggested I see a shaman. I had already finished a cup of tea and was getting a little freaked out, but oddly felt a little more calm after hearing her speak, and thanked them and left. I tried not to run to my car, but walked very quickly to my car and left. That night and a night or two later I had some very vivid dreams, but I can't remember anything of them, which is weird. I usually remember my dreams when I wake up, at least long enough to write them down. But these dreams, even though they woke me up, I couldn't remember. I don't really know what happened or if they were pulling my leg, but once I got home and really started looking into things, I kind of feel. I don't know. I feel like I'm crazy because I can't rationalize what happened. Even when writing this, I realize how insane this all sounds. And I still can't even fully describe how I felt, how weird everything got. It's just hard to put into words, but I had to share this with people who might understand, have their own insight. In the dense wilderness of Yosemite National Park, an unknown predator roamed free, having escaped from a secretive government facility. It moved with calculated stealth, blending seamlessly with the shadows of the towering trees. Its true nature remained shrouded in mystery, but its intentions were clear to hunt and conquer. Meanwhile, in a fog-laden coastal park, Ranger Ray carried out his duties with unwavering dedication. The tranquil beauty of the mist-filled landscape was disrupted by whispers, eerie voices that seemed to materialize from the ethereal veil. Ray's senses heightened as the whispers grew more menacing echoing through the damp air. He knew he was no longer alone. Within the mist, an unseen predator lurked, its malevolent presence growing ever closer. Ray's heart raced as he navigated the treacherous trails, his footsteps muffled by the fog. Suddenly, the creature pounced, its feral instincts taking hold. It bore an uncanny resemblance to a Sasquatch, 
but its eyes glowed a menacing shade of red. In a desperate bid for survival, Ray reached for his weapon, aiming to defend himself against the nightmarish assailant. A fierce struggle ensued, their bodies locked in a battle for dominance. Adrenaline surged through Ray's veins as he fought against the overwhelming force of the predator. With sheer determination, Ray managed to seize his gun, unleashing a volley of bullets at the beast. The creature collapsed, its lifeless body sinking into the damp earth. Relief washed over Ray as he caught his breath, believing the threat had been vanquished. But his respite was short-lived. Moments later, a group of men dressed in black arrived, their presence enigmatic and foreboding. They swiftly collected the lifeless creature, showing no concern for Ray's well-belling. Before he could protest, darkness descended upon him as he succumbed to unconsciousness. When Ray awoke, he found himself disoriented and alone. The memory of the encounter remained vivid in his mind, but the man in black and the enigmatic creature had vanished without a trace. Questions lingered, but Ray knew that the truth lay hidden in the depths of secrecy. Me and my pregnant wife were staying at my parents' house in northwest Tennessee on September 17, 2021. It is about 50 yards from our new house. I went out on their back patio to smoke a cigarette around 12 a.m. Over the fence, I heard something that sounds like it was choking on something, but at the same time sounded like a distorted pig squealing. It would make sounds in about two, three seconds spurts. I honestly thought it was a hawk or owl, anything that could be explained. I thought it was definitely weird, but probably natural. About three hours later, I couldn't sleep and decided I would go to the gym. As I'm walking to my car across the yard and towards the road, I hear this same weird sound coming from about 50 yards away at my 10 o'clock direction. I looked around and I couldn't see anything or hear anything. Then I hear, hey, hey, in a woman's voice coming from the same direction. So I look back up and there was nothing there. As I'm scanning the yard, I hear that loud squealing noise again. I got in my car and dipped as fast as possible. I thought it was weird, but didn't give it a second thought until a month later I was on TikTok and saw a video of a man riding a horse in Arizona, I believe. And in the video, I heard a woman say, hey, hey, this makes him and the horse both freak out and run away. It was believed to be a skinwalker. When I heard that same voice and those same words, almost like a recording, my heart sank to my stomach. I really don't believe in any of this, and I've tried every way I can to disprove it, and I truly can't. It doesn't scare me as much anymore as it intrigues me. I am so, so curious to know what that was, and why me? This was last year in Bordeaux, France. I lived in a building that was going to be destroyed, so there were only like three apartments out of sixty with people in it and they were far. From me in another branch of the building, I was sleeping in my room. It was during summer. Then I remember being woke up by something tapping on my window. When I looked at it, I saw something strange. I'm not native English speaker, so excuse me if it's difficult to explain. There was a shape, human-sized, I guess, moving on the balcony. It was like in the movie Predator when the creature is in stealth mode, or like in summer when on a road you see heat coming out of the road and your vision is a little bit blurry cause of that. At first, being half sleeping, I thought why the F did I put the radiator on? Every time I tried to close my eyes to go back to sleep, there was two distinct tapping sounds on one of the windows, three different one, one I can see through and two I can't cause of shutters. It was like something was messing with me, and it was every time I closed my eyes. Easy to spot cause I was sleeping facing the window and not far from it. As I told you, there was no one in this part of the building. I lived on the third floor, with no trees or thing in front that can cause such a sound. And he too tapping were every time at the same interval. 
I started to be really scared when I noticed that the shape was moving in order to tap on different windows. It was so disturbing that I couldn't move an inch. It was like this for quite a time. Maybe hours, can't tell, was too afraid to even take my phone. When the sun was rising, I probably felt asleep out of exhaustion. I will never forget this feeling of dread and pure fear when I saw this shape. My mom, brother, and I were driving over a highway overpass one night a few years back, and this big, black, hairless creature jumped over the side of the overpass, ran on all fours in front of our car and a few others, jumped over the dividing median but grabbed it with its front feet, ran in front of the other cars on the other side of the highway, then jumped down the other side of the overpass. This thing had really long, skinny front legs and very short back legs, was skinny, and when our headlights shone on it, it turned its head to look at the traffic coming towards it. Its face was creepily long, like a horse, almost, or a big deer. It was just weird and didn't look like anything my mom or I had ever seen before. This was like ten years ago, and I've been trying to come up with every idea of what it could have been. A manged black bear, some strange manged wolf, or black manged coyote or something, but nothing looks like it at all. The head, though, is what F's with me. It was much too big and long for the body. My mom and I saw it and slammed on the brakes like other drivers next to us. We were freaking out trying to figure out what we just saw while my brother in the back seat trying to figure out what happened because he didn't see it but saw everyone hitting thire brakes and slamming thire horn. This happened in Silverdale, Washington. There is a hike to the top of Pikes Peak that has a camp halfway up popular with tourists. It's a pretty tough 13 miles to the peak. I do a shorter hike that breaks off and shares the same trail that loops around. I often love doing the loop twice. On my first loop, about three miles from the trailhead, I come across a British couple who were very nice and looked like they were having a great time. They told me a little about themselves, and they asked me how much further was to the camp at the halfway point, and I told them it was about another three miles further up. They told me they were staying at the camp, and I found it a bit odd that they weren't carrying backpacks or supplies except for water. They thanked me and also told me, oh, and do mind that our luggage is coming up behind us. I thought to myself, luggage. On the way down, and I saw what they meant. About 1.5 miles from the trailhead, here was a young Indian man carrying two huge red luggages up the trail by himself. These were the types of luggages you see at hotels with tiny wheels and both looked extremely heavy. The only way this young man, who I presume to be their butler of sorts, can move the luggages up the trail was to lift up one at a time with both arms a few feet forward set it down, and repeat with the other one. He looked pretty tired, and he wasn't even nearly a quarter of the way to the camp. He was wearing regular street clothes, no sweater, and wearing flat converse shoes, which are awful for hiking. I spoke to him a little bit, and with his thick Indian accent, he also had questions about how long it was to the camp. He made a sad sigh when I said he still had about four one-half miles to go. It was around 5 p.m., and the sun was already starting to set, and I let him know that it, at this pace, I wasn't sure if he'd make up there before dark. All he could say was, well, they're expecting their stuff to be up there, so I have to make it today. I wished him luck and went on my way. On my second loop around the shorter trail, I didn't come across the well-off British couple again. They must have continued on past where the trail splits. I did, however, come across the young man again, who, after about two hours, had only made about another mile of progress. He looked absolutely exhausted, and the wheels of the luggages were completely worn down to the base, so he had to continue carrying them up one at a time. It looked like his back was hurting, too. He again asked me how much further it was to the camp. 
To his dismay, I let him know that he still wasn't even halfway there. I asked him what he was going to do. He had no idea. He came to the conclusion that he'll probably just sleep by the side of the trail and then try to make it up in the morning. He asked me if I had any water that he can buy off of me. I had a spare Gatorade, and he mentioned that he only had a $50 bill. But he was willing to give it to me, seeing how desperate of a situation he was to offer so much for a drink and how tired he looked. I just gave it to him and told him to keep the money. I have no idea what happened afterwards, but that was one of the most weird things I've ever seen. This guy was totally unprepared for a hike like this. I felt super bad for him. I wonder how his night went, what that British couple decided to do without their supplies making it up that night. I hope they eventually went back down to help him. I was backpacking alone at Mount Rainier. During the night, I saw three circular, flat-flying objects hovering like 100 feet in the sky, doing patterns. They would leave and come back, and it was all night, from dusk until dawn. At one point, one hovered over my tent. I had the rain fly off, so I watched them through the mesh the entire night, frozen with fear. As soon as the sun rose, I shoved all of my gear into my pack and ran all the way back to my car. I drove to the ranger station to ask if they were testing any weird equipment. He said there was a military base nearby. Those things did not look like any drones I've ever seen or anything that I can explain. The bummer is that I was alone in that entire wilderness area, and no one else got to see it. I was hiking and camping in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains with intent to summit some mountains the next few days. I make camp for the night and I'm just enjoying the evening when I hear a bunch of motorized equipment, four-wheelers and dirt bikes below me tearing up in the meadow. There are probably 20-20 five people in this group. The route I came in didn't allow any motorized equipment, but oh well, what can you do anymore? So they start to make camp also and are boisterous and loud. I am certain there is a lot of alcohol being consumed. Not the experience I was planning to have, but I am moving on in the morning. Around 11 p.m. I'm trying to sleep in my tent and the party is still raging. Then the gunshots start. The drunks are just shooting wildly in all directions out of their camp to being the party to a whole other level. I'm about 400 feet away, and they are shooting in my direction. There is a large boulder near my campsite, so I exit my tent and set my sleeping bag up on the other side of the boulder to avoid being struck by any stray bullets that might travel that far. I pack up and leave in the morning and encounter one of the group awake smoking a cigarette. He asked where I came from, and I indicated by pointing and said where you were shooting at last night. His reply was, oh, and I just walked away. I went back to that area about a month later, and all of their trash was left behind. Out of staters coming to Colorado and trashing it to have a good time on vacation is one of the reasons I left the state, to live somewhere less popular for tourism and more wild. That will change someday, too. A couple years ago, when I was still in high school, my friend and I were walking along a long and lonesome road in southern Pennsylvania. We were bored as hell and looking for bottles alongside the road to smash against rocks and trees, just talking about nothing as we went along. Very few cars traveled that road, and for a long time we didn't see any, so we just walked in the road now and then. I don't remember when I noticed but the entire world turned red. It was as if a red curtain was pulled in front of the sun and washed everything in a light crimson ting. It started as bad, and I'm glad he was there to confirm it, because I thought I was going crazy or having a stroke or something. When nothing happened for a while, we just kept walking, but I felt extremely on edge, like something was very wrong. Eventually, the red light faded after what felt like forever, but was probably 10 or 15 minutes. 
I have never seen or heard of anything like it before or since. I was with my friends at a cottage in the middle of the forest, secluded as F. We went there to, to party hard and spent three days being completely cray-faced. We had just as much hard alcohol as we had water. So this night, when it's after midnight, we decide to take a stroll to a nearby Jewish graveyard. We're in Czech Republic on German border. I don't know why there's cemetery over there. There is literally no civilization all around it. Well, so we set off. We have to follow a dirt trail through a very dense forest. With no other light source other than my camera's orange focusing light, which, surprise, barely illuminated anything. Needles to say we were S-faced. We barely walked. I had my German shepherd with me who kept running back and forth, making sure his herd of friends is safe. Fast forward to the cemetery. Nothing weird has happened. We poked around. Did some silly crap and then decided to return. Once we are going through the most claustrophobic area of the forest, I can hear a rustling in the bushes. Something moving very, very loudly. I use focus on my camera for the little orange light and see a figure. So I click the button to take a picture with a flash. Everyone screamed as we saw a person who yelled back gibberish and continued to walk towards us like a freaking zombie. We set off and run. My doggo, probably confused, starts to bark and runs with us. It's only that we stopped running that one of our friends yells back at us that we're idiots and that it's one of our buddies who got lost on the way to cemetery. Later he passed out, so we had to drag him back. I told the F that it wasn't the best idea to bring rum with him. Kinda upset at our mids later. What if we completely forgot about him? He had to have been alone for more than 30 minutes while barely conscious. I was walking my dog very early one morning, and I was the only person out at the time. It was winter, so it was quite cold, and the streets were icy. All of a sudden, from behind me, I heard this low, guttural, growling noise. I turned around and I saw way, way up the street behind me a man walking my way. I thought surely it couldn't be him making the noise as he seemed too far away. Anyway, I dismissed it and kept walking. A couple of minutes later I heard it again. Only this time it was right behind me. My dog starts freaking out, barking and trying to get it at whatever it was making this noise. This time I didn't look behind me, I just started walking faster. The growls became louder and longer. It was the weirdest thing. It sounded like a cross between a demon and an animal. Anyway, I practically dragged my dog to our house and slammed the door. I ran to the window and looked out. There was nothing there. I told my husband. He just shrugged his shoulders and dismissed the whole thing. After it happened, I bought a vial of pepper spray... So one night I decided to go to sleep after a whopping three days of no sleep. But no, I have to get the spook of my life to keep me up the rest of the night. I was up late, around 2.30 a.m. or something like that, and I was ready to hit the hay. But before that, I was going to have nice ham and mayo sandwich. Leaning on an open window, looking out on the street, it was super empty. I live in a pretty scummy area, full of eshes. Australian gangster wannabes, walking around acting like they own the place, but no, they were nowhere to be seen. I went to go wash my hands and go to be, but just after I left the window, I hear a deep screech that came from outside. You'd expect me to say there was dark figure, wouldn't you? It absolutely wasn't. I looked outside the window to see this lanky creature which almost looked like it's glowing, I rubbed my eyes and it was still there. I thought that cliché would work. I saw it walking down the street with continuous screams and it was kind of pissing me off, not going to lie. So I leave the window and go to the front of my house to go get a proper look from my front balcony. Gone. The screeching stopped when I left the window. 
I honestly should have gone to check the window to see if it was gone. When it stopped that, but it, again, it was around 2.40 a.m. at this point. Weird thing is that those Eshes haven't been around, causing havoc for a while. They did come back the night after, but then they just stopped as well as the monster. I honestly wonder if it just me, or if I actually saw something. I was probably just sleep deprived now that I think about it. The scariest part of it all is the fact that I've never had night terrors or even believe in the paranormal. But that was honestly something I thought no one, especially not myself, would have that experience. But I do believe in the phrase everything has a reason, but with them both mixing together. It really doesn't make sense, but all I can do is tell you guys this to determine this. Just a heads up, this was 2020 when I was isolated, if that makes it any more convincing. After that whole experience, I was making the Uries in my head all night, which was keeping me up until the sun rose. I still hear the sounds of the screech in my head sometimes, but when I try to replicate them out loud, it doesn't really sound right, if that makes sense. I want to think that that monster, or whatever that was real, and I wasn't just seeing things, but who knows. I honestly too lazy to do my own research on it, so I, I thought you guys would know better than anyone since you're so woke. Do y'all know what the hell that was? It was four or five years ago, but the memory of that night still haunts me. My ex-boyfriend and I were driving through one of Georgia's national battlefields, once an Indian land, with a history of haunting stories. The stars were shining brightly that night, and we wanted to take advantage of the clear sky and peaceful atmosphere. We cruised along the empty roads, windows down, enjoying the night air. My ex decided to stop at one of the fields to capture the beauty of the Milky Way with his camera. I stayed in the car, gazing at the sky, lost in the vast expanse above me. Suddenly, from the corner of my right eye, I saw something white crawling towards the car. My heart skipped a beat, and my first thought was that it must be a ghost. After all, the battlefield was known for its haunted past. But as I looked more closely, I realized this was something entirely different. This creature had no face and moved with an unnatural gait, as if all of its bones were broken. The sight of it sent shivers down my spine, and I was paralyzed with fear, unable to react or call out to my ex. As he finished taking the picture and returned to the car, I mustered the courage to turn and fully face the creature. It had stopped making its way towards us, and, as if sensing our attention, darted back into the woods. My ex, oblivious to what had just occurred, started the car, and we drove off, leaving the eerie encounter behind us. Ever since that night, I've believed that I came face to face with a skinwalker. The fact that it had no eyes made me question my conclusion, but the experience was too terrifying and unexplainable to be anything else. To this day, I can't shake the image of that faceless creature crawling towards us, and the memory of that night serves as a chilling reminder of the unknown lurking in the shadows. I had an eerie encounter during a solo hunting trip. I had successfully tagged out on the first day of a deer hunt, and with ten full days off work, I wasn't ready to return to the real world just yet. I decided to spend a few nights exploring new areas of the hunting unit for future seasons. I took a service road deep into the wilderness and found the perfect spot in a valley surrounded by towering peaks. I set up camp and then ventured out to scout the area for deer, just for fun. As I headed back to camp, I noticed something peculiar. Several of the trees surrounding my campsite were scarred with deep vertical marks. They looked like claw marks, but I couldn't tell if they were from a bear, a mountain lion, or even purposefully made by someone trying to fool people like me. I shrugged it off and settled in for the night. Being a light sleeper, any sound or disturbance could easily awaken me, and in the dead of night, that's precisely what happened. 
I was jolted awake by the most chilling sound I'd ever heard, a screaming banshee like wail echoing through the valley. I lay there frozen in my sleeping bag as the eerie sound repeated several times, each scream sending shivers down my spine. I tried to rationalize the noise, telling myself it must be a distant animal or the wind howling through the trees. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something otherworldly was out there, haunting the valley. As morning broke, I packed up my camp, my nerves still on edge from the night before. I left the area, unable to shake the memory of the spine-chilling screams and the unexplained claw marks. To this day, the experience remains one of the most unsettling moments of my life, a reminder that there are still mysteries lurking in the wild, waiting to be discovered by the unsuspecting adventurer. I'm atheist, so, or I'm an abnormally lucky guy, or somebody is watching out for me. Not one, not two, not three, but four times I had this urgency to go to an open area. If I were claustrophobic, I would understand it, but I, when I got to this open area, not one single building around me and strong earthquake will hit the town. Puebla. 1998, 1999, and 2017 in Arizaba, 2015. Weird thing is, I don't live in those cities. Four times I've outran in Hurricane Category 5 by matter of hours. When I need something, I usually get it. You want to know how crazy it has become, this last year due pandemic. United States Consulate in Mexico stopped all working related to foreign visas without visa. I couldn't work on the United States, so I got dumped of that opportunity. Fast forward to September and another chance is hitting my doorbell. Better salary, better conditions, just plain better. But since I didn't cancel my visa appointment, I had preference during the few three or four weeks. The United States consulate worked before having to shut down again. Everything was just one day to do. One day wait to the interview, one day to get the visa. From there, I can go on and on about losing bus tickets only to later seeing that bus was wrecked or hijacked, only studying the topics of intest. Was so common, my classmates were pending on what topics I ended up studying. Seriously, I'm a very lucky person. And before you ask, I had never lost on lotteries, scratches, and those kind of things. Never. I've never won big time, but never lost, and I got the feeling I shouldn't keep trying. I can't honestly explain from where such good luck comes, and I know statistics, and I know chances are almost always on our favor. But seriously, I just have so much luck that is just ridiculous. Living in a small town can often mean long drives to access shopping centers and entertainment venues. My ex-girlfriend, my daughter, and I decided to head to the nearest city about 25 miles away to spend a weekend browsing bookstores and enjoying a day out just like we used to do before my ex left in C-19 disrupted our life. The drive was familiar and uneventful taking us past a state park that we'd visited countless times before. However, on this particular day, something strange caught my eye, hovering about a hundred feet or so above the center of the road, just above the tree line, was a shiny metallic ball. Its presence was inexplicable, and I couldn't take my eyes off it as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. My focus on the mysterious object meant that I was no longer paying attention to the road, and before I knew it, the car had veered too far to the side, causing the tires to make that unmistakable brar sound as they hit the grooves on the shoulder. My ex-girlfriend, clearly alarmed, shouted, Babe, urging me to correct our course and avoid an accident. I quickly straightened the car and asked her, Do you see that? She responded with a puzzled, what? 
When I looked up again to point out the strange metallic ball, it had completely vanished. It was as if it had never been there in the first place, and I was left questioning my own perception. We continued on our journey to the city, but the encounter with the mysterious object weighed heavily on my mind. I replayed the incident over and over in my head, trying to understand what I'd seen and why it had disappeared so suddenly. My ex-girlfriend and daughter remained skeptical, but I knew that what I had witnessed was not a figment of my imagination. To this day, I still have no explanation for the shiny metallic ball that appeared and vanished in the blink of an eye. The experience has left me with a sense of awe and curiosity, a reminder that there is always more to discover and that the world around us is filled with mysteries waiting to be explored. I'd like to start this by stating that I don't believe in the supernatural, but once, when I was 16, I was at a sleepover at a friend's house and at about 3 a.m. I got up to get myself a cup of water. My bud was half asleep, but I asked if he wanted one too, which he just kinda did the mime sound to, and, and then turned to face away from the door in bed. I got out the door as the room was directly connected to the kitchen grabbed two cups and filled them. As I now had both my hands full, I tried to whisper for him to open the door as others in the house were asleep. I saw his hand crawl around the edge of the very slightly open door. The door started pulling into the room, but with closer inspection, the hand was completely blue, tinted with very yellow nails and way skinnier than hands of anyone in the house. I got into the room, not thinking too much of it, turned out. He was completely asleep, still turned away from the door. Didn't freak me out till the day after. My best friend of 16 years told me a story that I will never forget. This didn't happen directly to me, but it scared the shit out of me that I literally think about this tale once a week. This friend and I have been best buds since the first day of kindergarten. She's an atheist who has never believed in ghosts or anything paranormal. I used to tell her ghost stories all the time to try and mess with her, but she's all science. After she moved into this house, I think her beliefs have changed a bit. She and two other roommates and a cat moved into this old house in North Carolina that was notorious for being spooky and haunted. Weird things would happen all of the time. For example, her roommate was sitting on her bed once and her desktop computer mouse unplugged itself and literally flew across the room. The cat would be fine one minute, then look into a dark corner and hiss stand on her haunches, run and hide. They would hear noises, feel they were being watched. All typical haunted house stuff. One of the creepiest parts of this story isn't actually paranormal at all. This old, old woman, whose husband later told the group she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, would frequently come to the house and knock on the door asking to see her mother. I suppose she lived in the neighborhood and would walk to the house and the husband, still with a clear mind, would have to drive and apologetically pick up his wife and take her home. The roommates would gently tell her that no one lives there except the three of them, and she would usually leave, confused. One day, my friend was home alone, sitting on the couch, watching TV. The back door was located behind the couch. Because of the TV, my friend didn't hear the back door open, but she sensed someone behind her. She turned around, and that old woman was standing there, calling out for her mother. My friend freaked and told the woman she had to leave and escorted her to the door. I guess the old woman stopped coming around after that. So fast forward a few months and the three roommates, two girls, one guy, decided to move out and go their separate ways, but the night before they moved out, they decided to wide you board the plate. I told my friend she's a idiot for doing this and apparently the little cup or whatever was flying around that board. Something came through. They asked it several questions. They asked if it was here alone and it said no. They asked if it was human and it said no. And that was that. But it gets weirder. 
My friend told me she'd often be driving to work or her new apartment in the same town and would just end up at the house. Like she had no control or awareness of where she was driving, she would just go there. One time she said she even knocked and tried to move back in without knowing why or where this impulse was coming from. This happened to her often. The three roommates later met up at a party and they discussed their time in the house. She told them about this weird habit she'd picked up and said they both turned white. Apparently, all three of them had been doing this, driving to the house uncontrollably and not being able to explain why. At the same party after my friend and the other girl had left, this random chick approached the boy roommate having no knowledge of their past with the house. She said, I know this may sound weird, but I'm a medium, and you have three things attached to you. Do you know anyone close to you who has passed? The boy skeptically responded, Yes, I lost both of my parents a few years ago. Could it be them? The medium said two of the attachments could be your parents. But that third thing is something else. That third thing is dark and it wants you back. Now we can argue she made this up to try and frighten me, but I can promise you I know when she's lying or trying to prank me. The specificity of this story is too legit, and she'd have no reason to make this up. I'm just really glad she never asked me to sleep over while she lived there. As you all know, it's Halloween, and my friends and I just had a really weird experience. We were sitting in the cemetery next to the host friend's house and smoking weed at around 9.39, 45 p.m. We were just messing around and having fun until we heard a super loud growl from the woods behind us. Like, not an animal growl, but not a man growl either. It sounded like Mongolian throat singing or something. I asked everyone, did you guys hear that? But nobody responded, and one of my friends took off running. We all took off running after her. Even my friend, whose legs give out on him a lot, and would be in extreme pain every time he ran. So I know they weren't doing it tough with me. My one friend said he could hear someone running through the woods behind us, and another friend heard what sounded like a man yelling after us. The neighborhood is full of extremely rich old people, and none of us think they would pull a prank like that, especially since it was pitch black and we had no flashlight, so you wouldn't just be able to casually see us in the cemetery unless you were looking on purpose. Any ideas on what the F just happened to us? On that day, July 17, 2017, I was relaxing at home in Santa Cruz, California, when I noticed some movement across the street from my kitchen window. It's a small side street with lots of large trees. It was hard to tell what I was seeing at first because they appeared to have some sort of camouflage, but they looked like black SWAT uniforms with small yellow lettering. Once I was able to get a better view, they were up in a tree, very well hidden by the leaves, and I was only really able to see them when they moved. It was apparent when they moved as opposed to the wind, because only a small section of a branch would vibrate. I was startled and anxious because they were looking toward my house, and I first thought they had me under surveillance or something and couldn't understand what was going on. I watched them in the tree for at least five, ten minutes, and I was crouched low looking through a cutout in my fence. They seemed to spot me at some point, and some kind of faint beeping sound started, like an alarm on a radio or walkie. Talkie. They then began trying to slowly and secretly climb down ropes that I could see being controlled by a man high in the tree wearing a blue jacket. They dropped out of sight behind the neighbor across the street's fence. So this was all weird enough, but what happened next was absolutely mind-blowing. I was trying to see where they went behind the fence and noticed something very tall at the back of the driveway of their next-door neighbor. Their driveway extends behind their house into the backyard. I realized I was looking at an unbelievably tall woman with very blonde long hair. 
She had a sort of gray and white jumpsuit on with a strange-looking oval back covering that went around the top of her head and all the way down to her feet. It was only solid in the back and was whitish in color with a patterned border around the edge. It didn't really look like fabric, but I couldn't tell what it was. Her eyes were extremely large. She stood very still, but moved slightly, and there seemed to be a shorter humanoid shape wearing the same color jumpsuit moving around rather wildly at her feet. But the shadow of the fence made it hard to see that part. The sunlight was good and bright, and the only obstruction was some sparse shadowing from tree leaves. Not really sure what I was looking at, I looked back to where the black-wearing tree climbers had been and saw that suddenly there was now a short, skin-colored something standing behind their fence. The fence is a lattice pattern, so there are a good many holes you can see through. It was too short to be seen over the top of the fence, but I could see a very large face with a deeply wrinkled forehead and eyes that almost looked like they were made of some kind of glitter. They were very large and somewhat rounder than what people usually describe as alien eyes. I could see that it was looking right at me, so not knowing what else to do, I waved at it. It then reached a hand with very long bony fingers through the fence lattice and waved back. It waved a couple more times, stopping in between waves. I was so stunned that I had to look away and shake my head to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. When I looked back, it had stopped waving and was a little farther back from the fence. It seemed like a good entity, whatever it was. Even though I was seeing from across the street through two fences, I could see it quite well. Things somehow got even weirder after that. I decided to lie down for a minute, glancing back to where the massive woman had been, but there didn't seem to be anyone there anymore. I went up into my little loft, which is several skylights under a giant live oak tree. I stared at the tree, trying to process what I had just witnessed, when I noticed a couple of branches quivering like the ones the covert ops guys had been shaking. I expected to see more of those creepy agents, but instead strained to see a much smaller creature climbing expertly up into the high branches. It was difficult to see it clearly because it seemed to be a dusty gray-green color, much like the bark and leaves of the tree. It seemed to have textured skin, possibly scaly, and it, it had angular face with teeny tiny little projections like little horns or possibly short antennae. It has a small mouth that looked full of sharp teeth. Its eyes were quite large and dark. It had a humanoid build but was short. I stared at this for many minutes, wondering what the hell was going on. Then I caught sight of some slight movement on other branches and saw two more of the same creatures climbing easily up the tall tree. They reached a high up branch that was big enough to lie on. The light, once they stopped moving much, was not ideal and it was hard to see them when they were sitting still. In the shade of the branches, it looked like an even smaller dark green creature was working on the gray-colored one's back somehow. It looked like a massage to me. I watched until my neck was too painful from looking up to continue. When I looked back a little later, the branches were empty. This was all preceded by an unnerving experience late the night before. I got up to get water and glanced at the driveway neighbor's window. Inside, I saw an unnaturally gangly figure that was bluish light gray. It was staring out of their window directly at me, which caught me off guard, and I let out a little shriek. I walked from the kitchen into the bathroom and looked again, seeing that its eyes followed where I was. I called my boyfriend in fear and told him what I was seeing. He was just excited while I was scared. I thought that would be the end of it when I went to bed, but the next day was even crazier. I wish I had a way to find out what was going on. There was also a very small orb darting about the branches of the oak tree, and any time it would graze a twig, it would give a little shake. I've never seen a bird or bug or other flying life form move in that manner. I attest that this is all true, and I described it to the best of my knowledge. I've never seen anything like this before and really would like to know what was going on. And if it is real, why so many different kinds of extraterrestrials were in my neighborhood? Thanks for listening.
Hope to see you tomorrow, son.